Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We have a great guest on for tonight. Give me one sec to get my technical stuff set up here, like always. And we'll be right to it. There we go. Awesome. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody who's watching in the chat right now. And uh, everybody who's going to watch the replay, this is going to be a great show. I promise we have a great guest on. Um, so my guest tonight has done numerous, numerous radio shows. Uh, he's been getting into the YouTube scene. He's been on my friend uh, Jason from Redfish Bluefish's channel. And tonight he's coming to Canada. Everybody help me welcome Mr. Jim Carmark. Hello, Good Jim. Guys. How are you doing? We're awesome, and we're glad to have you on. So, uh, yeah, for anybody, I may have some different viewers than Jason had. So uh, why don't you tell some of our maybe Canadian viewers uh, a little bit about yourself if uh, they don't really know much about you? Well, I've been keeping fish for 63 years. Uh, I've owned and managed uh, a few different pet stores and um, I'm a hazardous waste chemist. Uh, I have a mining in biology. Um, I was in the hazardous waste business for 25 years. I've been to South America 18 times. I've been 40, 40 trips to Central America. Uh, every habitat you can imagine. Uh, and uh, I really like fish. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, everybody that watches my channel likes fish, so uh, I'm sure everybody's going to get something out of this. we got a few people in now, so um, anybody who's just coming in, uh, if you have questions for Jim, just post them in the chat, and I will do my very best to get everybody's question to Jim, because uh, quite frankly, Jim likes answering questions. Um, Jim and myself... Uh, we talked for, I don't know, what, an hour the other night on the phone, and, uh, and we didn't even realize uh, that we were – I didn't realize that we had talked that long. So uh, he uh, he likes to uh, answer questions, so bring them on. Now, Jim, one person's saying uh, that your sound's maybe not all that good right now, and I was kind of noticing that too, um, maybe a little closer to your microphone or – yeah, let me turn down the back. We've got a rather large uh, uh, vibrator pump behind us. So. Oh, that's 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 better already. Yes. Good. Okay, perfect. So, um, I guess I'll start with a question for you. Um, I know you live uh, in Massachusetts right now, right? Right now, yeah, I'm in Quincy, Massachusetts, right on the ocean. And you're heading off to Florida for war something. Spring. Spring Hill, Florida, right next to Brooksville, which is halfway between Tampa and Orlando, and I work at a zoo down there. I'm in charge oh. of I'm in charge of anything wet. It's called uh, Boyette Citrus Attraction, and it was an old um, uh, orange grove and, and uh, citrus processing plant that they had a few animals you know, 50 years ago, and it's developed into a, about a 50-acre zoo with all kinds of cool stuff. Oh, cool. So did they have... Of, I'm in charge of anything wet. So I get the turtles, the crocodiles, and the fish. Oh, very good. Large fish displays, I'm sure, if you're involved. Um, well, yeah. We have a... Uh, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, I had to talk my way into the job. I asked him for a job there when I first went down. And they said, no, we're, we're good, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep you in mind. And I said, well, don't you have any projects that you need? And they said, well, we have this 14,000-gallon tank that's, that you can't get full for 25 years. I think you can fix it. And I said, yeah, let me take a look at it. So it was made, had maybe four feet of water, and I pumped it down, and I jumped into it, and I ended up cutting 39 pounds of silicone rubber off of the surround around the plexiglass window to discover that the concrete underneath it was all cracked and chipped. So it took me about, oh, I don't know, three hours to fix a tank that leaked. Jesus. 
that's a lot of water. Yeah, it's going to be a uh, Malawi cichlid tank. I've been acquiring cichlids up here. It's going to be Malawi cichlid tank with crocodiles. With crocodiles. Yeah. Oh, that'd be uh, pretty neat. Any, uh, I see my friend Steve's on here. Steve Langley he asked about hippos. They're gonna have like hippos and stuff there. Uh, no, we're not. Well, we've considered it, but I mean, I would love to do an exhi a big exhibit with, uh, like they do in is it Ohio? I think Cincinnati Zoo in Ohio has the uh, um, hippopotamus and Malawi cichlids together, and the the Malawi actually graze on the hippopotamus. Eating all the whatever grows on it. Ah, uh, yeah, I would yeah. love to do that. Um, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. So, are you um, gonna like have your own little setup there too? Like, you're not gonna give up breeding fish or anything like well, that. Like, you're gonna have your own thing going there too. Uh, the owners of um, of the zoo are some of the nicest people I've ever met. Really generous. Uh, they got. Helping the animals and they told me that they, first of all, I haven't been back for almost a year. I'm supposed to go back this winter, and this COVID thing hit, and I couldn't go back. Um, so they, I mean, they call me every week when he coming back, when he coming back, coming back. And uh, they, there was a warehouse that I could use for a fish breeding operation. Three small greenhouses that I can use for growing plants and things like that. So, yeah, we're really excited about that. Okay. Uh, I'm, going back, I'm going back down there, I think, on the 16th, and uh, we'll be we'll be doing some some cool stuff. I really uh, I want to get into this a little bit later, but a lot of the fuckos uh, in the hobby are really not. Uh, good fish for long-term sustainable habits. Uh, they take so long to mature. The Red Devil Pucko L25, they think might not breed until it's 12 years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, how many of those can you yank out of the wild before you start impacting the population? Yeah, and how many people are going to keep one that long without a, a heater blowing or something in 12 years, there's a good chance of a tragedy in your aquarium to happen before it even gets a chance to breed. Yep. And plus, it doesn't breed until it's a foot long. So yeah. Right away, you got to, you need a couple hundred gallon tank uh, in order to um, have success with these guys. <coughs> what they're doing in Asia is they build these great big concrete tanks. Uh, three meters by two meters by a meter. And they're dark. They're, they're kept indoors in these completely dark environments with just one little light bulb. Uh, hmm. in the, uh, breeding room of maybe 40 feet by 30 feet. And uh, they haven't success with a lot of sunshine and uh, mangoes and uh, uh, so much. Your okay. sound's cutting out a bit again, Jim. I don't know where. Yeah, I can hear you, but it's cutting out mid sentence on you. I don't. I don't know. Is it just off? Are you just working off your computer? We're working off of the phone. Oh, okay, off the phone. Okay, I maybe closer to it. I don't know. It's uh, but it is cutting out. But uh, anyways, yeah, continue. I'd like to talk to you about plecos too. I I'm kind of into plecos myself. Um, I keep uh, L128 uh, uh, Blue Phantoms. Yeah. Um, haven't had any success breeding them yet, but I've uh, heard not many people have had very good success breeding them. But uh, they are cool to keep. Let me tell you a funny story about plecos. Um, a few years back, I had a fish room with about 100 tanks, and my upper tanks were primarily South American with a couple tank and you can – um, uh, Julitochromus and uh, Lamprologus scattered among them. And I went away on a Friday. It was a cold, rainy Friday. It was maybe 60 degrees. And of course, as soon as my wife and I get on the road, uh, the skies cleared and mice. And Saturday and Sunday, it was both 100 degrees. 
I get back to the house. I open the fish room up. We, I close it up tight because it's cold. And suddenly it's you know tropical again. And um, I walk in the fish room. It's like 105 degrees in there. The top tanks are like 95, 96 degrees. All the tank and you can sickles in the top tank. And everything else was, was doing okay, but I said, hmm, I better get this guy's water change and get the temperature down a bit. So I changed about 30 tanks in the next uh, uh, five hours. <clears throat> and a week later, I found baby pluckos everywhere. Uh, ah. uh, L002, L007. Um, this uh, L005, I think it was. Uh, amazing. I mean, uh, just little, look like little baby cockroaches scurrying around the tank. So basically, the opposite of what I've been told is like I've been told, hey, simulate the rainy season and drop cold water in the tank, drop the temperature a little bit, and you'll stimulate breeding. But you're you're saying you you have the proof that it's actually raised the temperature. And well, you might uh, trigger it. Well, I it was raised, but then I did a water change with 80 degree it, water. It cooled it right off and again. I probably, I probably cooled it, you know, 10 to 15 degrees. Hmm. Um, not with cold water, but, you know, I, I took the, I believe in massive water change. You know, my, my philosophy is if in doubt, throw it out. I'm a chemist. I don't screw with my water. I use whatever comes out of the tap. Excuse me. 90% of my, my um, the fish that I keep. Uh, the exception is if I'm trying to breed rainforest fish. Uh, anybody who has used rainwater to keep fish in, soon realizes it's got a magical component. I'm not sure what it is, but I have tried to duplicate rainwater from him with our own water. And it's very similar, but it ain't the same. Um, we had a, a very accomplished breeder down in Fall River uh, who I had mentioned this to him, and we set up a rain capture system every time it rained. And he would use that for his water shoes. And he goes, Jimmy, this stuff is magic. He goes, everything's breeding for me. And uh, all the stuff that we the pistols, the dalkosis, some of the fuckos, all kinds of things. You put them in rainwater, and they just like, oh. And uh, in the rainforest, when it rains, I have seen a creek that was, oh, I don't know, 12 inches to 18 inches deep, uh, go from you know below my knees to up to my shoulders in one night. Jesus. And then back down again to less than waist deep by the next day. So those fish are okay with a water change and probably a pH change, probably a, an everything change. Right. Well, that's why I get a kick out of out of uh, these big box stores that say, oh, you don't want to change more than 10% of your water. No, you're, you're um, I have a good friend out in California, Pam Chin. Who breeds tropius? You get over 100 tanks of tropius. And she and I both believe in 100% water changes with aged water. Um, you can't, you, I, I call water out of the tap raw water or mains water. And generally, you can't use raw water uh, 100%. It just, it's got dissolved gases in it, it's got other stuff in it that is just detrimental to the fish. But man, you age it 24 hours and uh, you know filter it, a little bit of carbon, and you know you can you can do significant uh, improvement in water quality in a very short period of time. I mean I literally have a hose going out one side and clean water coming in the other. And uh, you know the there's no percentage in leaving old water behind. People people talk about, oh, you're going to lose all the bacteria. No, there shouldn't be any bacteria in your water. You can put an ultraviolet sterilizer on your tank, kill everything in the water, and you're not going to affect your biomarker. Yeah, some filters are have them built in now. 
Right, right. And um, you want very low levels of bacteria in your water. You don't want um, nutrient levels in the water very high because that will encourage bacteria growth. And in the water, it's not good. Uh, oh, they get um, uh, levels of five to fifteen thousand bacteria to the to the middle cubic centimeter hmm. in uh, ponds and rivers. Um, tap water contains one to five thousand bacteria, which people will be appalled at. You know, a lot of these bacteria are your friends and all enemies. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just like your gut, you know, you need the right bacteria and everything. And <clears throat> without the right bacteria challenging uh, the immune system once in a while, you don't develop healthy animals, us or fish. <laughs> but that said, uh, you want to, <clears throat> you know, drink clean water and breathe clean air, uh, even if you're sleeping on dirt. Uh, and fish are the same way. Uh, when I first started in this business, in this uh, hobby, uh, in a big way when I was 16, 17 years old, uh, I saw all these, uh, you know, I would go snorkeling in local streams and lakes and rivers. And I'd see driftwood and, and leaves and everything. And I asked people uh, that, you know, other old timers in the hobby, oh, you don't want to put any of that stuff in the tank. That can be detrimental. You'll end up with all this, all these problems. It's just the opposite. You know, the more biodiversity you can encourage in your aquarium, the more stable it becomes. If you have snails, and little ostracods, copepods, other little pods growing in the tank, the right bacteria, your whole system becomes much more resilient and stable. So that's it all works. Works. all works together. Yeah. All works together. Um, I actually, um, on on another camera, I actually have set up right now. I have it set up on a tank just like that. It just uh, it just works. I'll show people one sec here exactly what uh, Jim's talking about. That's uh, exactly what Jim's talking about right there. I have mosses in there, grasses in there, water lettuce, uh, lots of fish. I have lots of ancestors in there. But this tank requires so little maintenance, so little maintenance. Everything just kind of takes care of itself. Well, let me um, let me make a comment on uh, on something I did once. People often say, "How long can my fish go without food?" So I said, hmm. so I set up a twenty gallon tank with live plants and fed it, <clears throat> fed it, and get it going for. About a month and a half, two months. And then I stopped feeding it. And I didn't feed it for a week, two weeks, a month, two months, six months, nine months. I didn't put any food at all in the tank. Not one fish died. Not one fish got emaciated. They were slender, but they were not skinny. They were, we had, I had cardinals, I had dichrosis filamentosa, I had the employees. I had a pair of the pistols, uh, some mummy nose, and apparently they're eating off the biofilm and off the little critters that feed in the bio. And, uh, when uh, Kulinda did some work down in South America on gut content, we find that 90% of the gut content of most fish is what we call gut, uh, G R U T, which is broken up leaves and detritus and little bits of stuff on the bottom that the fish ingest in order to get that very small amount of nutrition that is growing on that, that stuff. And, uh, it's enough to keep them alive. You know, I mean, the protein content is probably 0.001%. But their waste won't foul the water either. Because right. it didn't have all the waste from all the protein and carbs and everything else either. Yeah, right. it's, a, it's just a natural natural cycle. Yep. Um, yeah. people, people said, well, isn't it cruel not to feed them? Well, I'll tell you, they were really unhappy about it for the first week or so. 
you know, everybody would come to the front of the tank looking at me like I owed them money. And, uh, <laughs> and I think I used to it to the point where you'd see the, the, the gardeners picking on the leaves and grazing on stuff. And, and um, talk about, you know, no algae at no. all. <laughs> no, they keep you know, her pretty clean. Um, yeah, it's uh, ourselves, our animals, we all, we're all overfed. People don't people think that if they're hungry, their cold blooded animals must be hungry too. And they don't function the same way as we do. You know, uh, many fish have a, a life cycle where six months of the year they don't eat. And then they eat like crazy for six months. The classic one is the tambaki, which we all call the, the red pot, the black pot. <clears throat> cool. The larger ones have a very interesting relationship to the rubber. Uh, are you familiar with that story? I am. I, I heard you uh, say it on Jason's uh, stream. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's it's fascinating how nature uh, interdependence on um, these just amazing. I mean, these rubber tree seeds would not germinate until they pass through the gut of the fish. Uh, you take a rubber tree seed and plant it, it doesn't do anything. It's got to be cracked and hit upon, hit upon by that before the germination switch is thrown. So it goes through schools of uh, Paku fish, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. the, the, the rubber tree has a fruit like a, a plum kind. Of. And the fish will, and it's got a very slippery seed. So the fish grabs the fruit and is eating it. And um, it's, it's funny it's to watch fish eat stuff uh, because they don't have any hands. It looks like a little kid rolling uh, corn in the car. And the, the, the fruit will be rotating in the water while they're chewing on it. And they get down to the seed and they bite down in the seed trying to crack it open to get to the meaty goodness inside. And biologists have found that about half the time they only manage to crack the seed but not break it open. And then that slippery coating, whoops, down it goes. And then the stomach acid acts upon it and the fish swims away and deposits that seed somewhere far from the parent tree. That's how the rubber tree has, has figured out how to disperse its seeds uh, in this flooded farm. Wow, that's crazy. That uh, so, if there is no fish, no rubber trees. That's absolutely correct. Yep. All right, Chewy's uh, got. A, oh, sorry. Dragon Layer's got a question for you, Jim. I believe. Uh, I went to get a tank someone wanted to get rid of. It had been sitting for eight months with no light, no filter, and had maybe six inches of water. There was a pleco and a tiger barb still alive in it. So it's a it's a comment, not a question. But yeah, uh, yeah fish can go I'm along. Not I'm sure. I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> I'm sure they weren't happy about it, but it uh, it happens. Uh, I went you, to I went to get to a, a a guy called me up and he goes like, my um, brother in law passed away. Can you come clean out his fish tank? And I said sure. I said uh, how long uh, has it been empty? He said well nobody's been in the apartment in a month. So I went there and there's a 55 gallon tank with about five inches of water, six inches of water, and a 29 inch pleco. Jesus. <laughs> Doing fun. Um, yeah, it takes up half time, the tank. Huh? Takes up half the tank. Yeah. Another time, a woman called me up and she said her, her son's uh, deployment had been extended. And could I go clean, empty the fish tank out and get rid of all the dead fish? Nine months. I went over to the apartment, opened the door up. He had a full gallon tank with about three and a half inches of water in it. Now, the light was on a timer, so it was going on and going off, but no filtration, nothing but aeration, and probably 40 or 50 fish in this tank. And they were all, not only were they alive and healthy, but there were babies in the room. Oh, wow. I called the woman and I said, there's, there's no dead fish here. I said, everything's doing fine. I filled it up with an automatic feeder on, and he got home like nine months later, seven months later, and uh, all his fish were doing fine. 
Fish, oh. you gotta remember, our fish live in spite of what we do, not because of what we do. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, Chewy's got a question for you. Uh, if Jim considers a good introduction of the upside down catfish of the Congo River, and would it interfere with Canadian Oliver Lucanus fish? Lucanus. Yep. Uh, yeah, fish the blind. Uh, Lampralogus or elephant nose fish? That's a good question. Um, I have had uh, elephant nose are it's because they're scaleless fish, they're very susceptible to bacterial diseases, as are synodonis. So, my most successful elephant nose plant was a 20 gallon long that I took. Um, Canadian peat moss, put it through a blender, blenderized it, and microwaved it, and the tank had a baby four inches of it, and uh, I had seven good size, probably nine inch long elephant in there for almost a year, doing dynamite. Uh, hmm. Each was four, five. Yeah, I was gotta say it wouldn't be, it would be very low. Yeah. Um, which brings up a, a point that I wanted to talk about. A lot of people that maintain rainforest fish do not realize that uh, biologically and chemically, below a pH of six, there's no ammonia. There's only ammonium, and it cannot be broken down by bacteria. The only thing that's going to uptake that ammonia are plants, or you can dilute it with water too. Uh, you know, the answer to pollution is dilution. Uh, and in this case, it's true. They can't rely upon your bacterial um, buddies to help you out in the situation because they have food is just not chemically available. You know? <laughs> so we have to be very cautious keeping acid water fish that we don't. Uh, uh, allow the nitrogenous waste to build up very high because you can get a real problem if you have, say, 10 parts a million ammonium, which is completely non toxic to the fish that are in there. But as soon as you do a water change and bring that pH up above six, uh, it converts the ammonium back to ammonia and then it's Katie Bob to do it. Yeah, then you got Gilburn. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, so that brings up a great point of like a lot of people have a hard time and I've struggled with it uh, until I've played around with stuff and how to keep your pH down and peat moss is, is a great uh, method for that. Uh, one thing that I do as well is uh, put peat moss in a, in a bag in the back of a hang on back filter and just let it go through and, uh, and I use straight RO water for that tank as well. So, uh, but you need the peat moss in there with the RO water because back to your comment about the rain and how the rain water was, uh, you found it very beneficial for your fish. Do you think that is because the rain water is stable? Whereas RO water is not stable. RO water is not stable at all. Do you think that's the reason? As a chemist, I suspect that there are a variety of ions that it picks up on the way down. The real Negro has been described as slightly contaminated distilled water. <laughs> and uh, there's not much in it. Um, and it's mostly rainwater. And, hmm. um, I think it's a number of things. I think it's trace compounds that are coming out of the, you know, uh, you got to remember that rain is usually formed on condensation, which is a little bit of dust. And who knows what that is in any given area? You know, right now we've got this huge Sahara dust storm coming across the ocean um, and hitting New England right now. Um, and yeah, how many billion tons of dust have been in the atmosphere of the year? 
I'm sure those add certain minerals and, and things like that to the, um, to the system. But you're absolutely right. I, I mean, I being a chemist, um, you would think that you can duplicate uh, a natural environment by building on, you know, taking pure water and doing this and doing that to it and, and getting it exactly like you want it. But there's something about natural water that came out of a brook or out of the sky that seems to have very positive results for certain animals. Some animals could care less. Uh, yeah. cichlids, most cichlids could care less. They uh, they like high pH. Well, African cichlids that right. they they like high pH. Right. Yeah. But even the ones that came out of the Rio Negro uh, were much less concerned about pH than the than the little critters. In the Rio Negro, a lot of people don't realize this. There are four hundred species of fish that only get to be an inch or so adult size. Four hundred species. Why do we have so few in the hobby? Because most of them are ugly. Ah, okay. <laughs> Makes sense. There's a, there's a lot of um, uh, what we call LBFs, little brown fish. Okay. That, uh, variations on a the theme. You know, they've got a touch of blue to the dorsal thing. They've got a little silver edge to the tail. They've got slightly elongated fins, but... They're pretty much mm, a lot of nondescript stuff. That said, there are things like uh, Copena, Copella, and Pyrulina, this splash chapter family, that are stunning. And there are red ones and green ones. Just wow. You, know, you never see those in the hobby. No. Uh, I, <clears throat> when I ran my wholesale business, I would often bring in fish that all they had on them for description was a native name. And I would buy a, a half a box of them. And we should explain to our listeners that when you buy a box of fish out of South America, uh, a box of cardinals is 500 fish. Okay. A box of pistols is 400 fish. A box of small ancestors is 200 fish. Um, a box of discus is large fish, 12 fish. So depending upon the size, you get obviously different amounts of fish coming. So, and uh, you can often buy a half a box. That's the smallest quantity that you can buy. So there's a significant investment uh, for many of these animals to be brought in. And uh, you don't want to get stuck with 200 or something that is small and brown and you can't sell. <laughs> um, I would try to do it every third shipment. I would try to buy something I'd never seen before. And uh, <laughs> sometimes I would get, uh, it's funny in, in the tropical fish, you can buy four different fish under one name. Uh, and sometimes you can buy um there's four names for one fish, and it, depending upon what country you're in. And some you know, people just don't know the name of the fish, or they just call it something <laughs> as well. Uh, well that being I mean, said, oh, ahead. sorry. I was going to say, Jim, I have uh, some questions here that pertain to your collection trips. Now, I guess my first question, like myself, I've never gone. I would love to go. It's on my bucket list. I would love I would love to go. So what are the logistics of planning a collection uh, a, a collection trip? Like who who would you even talk to to set something like this up? Well, that's a really good question. Um, we I started my first South American trip was in 1987. And I went to Peru with a bunch of uh, really good aquarists uh, uh, from the New England, New England and New Jersey area. And uh, when we got to the airport to leave, we found ourselves herded into a small room at gunpoint, ordered us to open up these 
these mysterious boxes and the uh, federalists were very upset to discover there were no drugs in there, all the world was probably fish. And they tried to hold us up for $100 a box and we settled on $20 a box to get them out of the country. So um, that's when we started going to Brazil and doing collecting trips in Brazil because they didn't do that for us. But now that INPA, which is the basically fish and wildlife uh, Brazil, uh, has gotten involved, you can't get fish out of the country on a personal basis. You have to have a license. So what you need to do is contact, uh, well, I go with Scott Dowd uh, of Newman Aquarium. He runs trips every February. And okay. you can collect stuff. Uh, you can't necessarily bring it home with you. But you can have it shipped to you. But you can have it shipped to you, right. And uh, what they do is they go through their collecting permit and their collecting license. And, and that way the, the wholesaler, distributor, signs off on all the paperwork. So I highly recommend hooking up with somebody, no matter okay. what you decide to go to. But it's really not difficult. The first time I went to Belize, uh, I spent almost three years in Belize. And the first time I went to Belize, I went to the Minister of the Environment. And I just walked in unannounced, introduced myself, and asked to speak to the guy in charge of fishes. And most of these people in these countries are very helpful. Um, and if they know you're only taking a few specimens and you're not going to uh, rape the environment, they're, they're very uh, uh, conducive to you can't be giving you a temporary permit or something like that in order to collect fish. I mean, I went, I was in Bermuda and uh, I went to Miss the Environment, and uh, in exchange for doing a hazardous waste survey of the island, you know, they gave me a clipping permit. I get to uh, fly out of there and they took me off to one side, and opened the boxes, looking at it. I said, Is there a problem? They said, Well, you know, this. It's collecting permit, thinking, well, is there something wrong with it? We don't know. We haven't seen one in 23 years. So, oh, <laughs> yeah. And, said, and you're good because that was one of my questions. Is there any permits to get? And yeah. I would assume, yeah, there was something to something to happen with that. In the immortal words of, I forget who it was, we don't need no stinking permits. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um, in my in my Peru day. We, uh, I said, you know, uh, I said, we had all the permits all, all uh, from the government. And I hid them to the police. And they said, oh, you are very sorry, Sam. These permits, these are weekday permits. Today is Saturday. You need a weekend permit. I go, there's no such thing as a, oh, wait a minute. Is it possible to buy one of these weekend permits? Oh, see, si, senor, we can do that. Yes. And uh, oh, yeah. said, how, much, how much would one of these weekend permits be? Oh, so, you know, they are lots of money. I'm thinking of myself if we're dead, what do they care? <laughs> that was kind of cold. But <laughs> I, uh, I said, well, you know, what, what, how much do you want? And he said, oh, we want $100 a box. And I go, $100 a box? Keep the fish. We don't want them. Uh, so, you know, what kind of, how much would you pay for the permit? I go five dollars a box. Oh, Senor, that is not enough money. We need at least fifty dollars a box. He said, "Not the question. Ten dollars a box is the most I'll go." Oh, Senor, maybe we can end this conversation right now. Twenty dollars a box. I said, "Done." Is <laughs> so. There's some um, that that was another question that I had about uh, collection trips. Like, there's some human risks too, right? Like. Obviously. Now I'm going to say maybe not any more than in my small city. Hell, people run around cutting people up, machetes and meth heads running all over the place. There's risk everywhere. But do you have a lot of risk of being extorted um, and such? And how do you, I guess, how are the fishermen with you that, that you're going collecting with? Um, do you stay in lodges? How does all that work? Well, Generally, um, 
rivers are the highways of the Amazon. So we rent a riverboat, uh, 70 to 90 feet in length. Oh, and, beauties. And we go with a crew of um, six or eight people and maybe a dozen aquarists. And we go up into the jungle, uh, a couple of days travel. And what we're trying to do is find, if you if you draw a circle around like the Quitos in uh, Peru, in the one day travel circle around Iquitos, we find 90% of the described animals. Okay. If you draw a two day circle, then we get 99% of the described animals. Hmm. You go outside, that, outside those two circles, and you find stuff all the time. That I've discovered so, seven new species myself. Um, I remember you saying that. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. Well, you, you uh, poke into enough corners where nobody's been, you find stuff nobody's seen. You know? So is this uh, like are, you're obviously getting away from the riverboat? Are they towing smaller boats behind the riverboat that you can blast off into smaller eddies and whatnot? Exactly. We call them canoes, which brings up a an interesting thing that happened to me one night. We're going up the Rio Negro and we tow four canoes behind us. And the canoes are 18 foot square end aluminum boats with an outboard motor on them. And they would take the outboard motor off and put it up on deck and tow the canoes behind. And uh, what we would do during the day was we'd go down and we'd climb into the canoes and, and hang over the side. They'd pull along hanging onto the canoes. Well, one night, and I should preface this by saying there was alcohol. Uh, no, no, no uh, good story doesn't start with that. <laughs> yeah, what are, what are the famous words in, in the South before an accident? Hold my beer and watch this. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a little bit of tequila, and I'm on, I'm on the back of the roof boat, and I'm holding on to the, the transom, and I'm being dragged along. And I switch arms and I'm holding on to the, the transom and I switch arms again and I miss. And I watch the riverboat right out of sight into the market. And I'm in the middle of the Rio Negro at midnight and nobody knows I'm going. And you're scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a bit perturbed. I'm wearing nothing but a pair of shorts. I've got nothing in the way of survival gear. i got no no method of making fire. I have no knife. I have everything that I made sure that I was competent with, and, and, and you know, all you know, all best, best laid plans of mice and men. Well, here I am, you know, basically naked, <laughs> except for a pair of shorts. I come over to the side of the road bank, and uh, there are not many mosquitoes in Rio Negro compared to the Amazon. Uh, I remember you saying that too. Why was that? There's... Um, it's due to primary productivity in the water. If you don't have a lot of nutrients, you don't get a lot of bacteria. If you don't have bacteria, you don't have food for the mosquitoes. Ah. Oh. So I mean, you don't find Daphnia, Moena, Copepod, Octopods. You just don't find those in large numbers. In large numbers. And if you have 400 different species of fish that don't get over two inches, I'm sure any that were found are probably eaten quite quickly. Right. And, uh, I mean, those, you're right. You're exactly right. Those smaller animals are searching for anything edible. But, including mosquito larvae. Exactly. But when I say there's not as many mosquitoes, that does not mean there's zero mosquito. And uh, so I'm sitting up on this piece of driftwood wondering what the heck I'm going to do. And I slathered myself with mud. And uh, four hours later, I see searchlight coming back down the river. Four and hours. Four hours. Yep. Yeah, I would have been pissed. It was a long four hours. You're probably sobering up pretty good. Oh, uh, yeah. And one thing that I should bring up that a lot of people don't realize is you and I right now, being in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, just went past the longest day of the year, and it was significantly longer than the shortest day of the year. And on the equator, there's no difference. Uh, 
day and night are exactly the same all the time. So you get 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. And you'd be amazed how cold it can get in the jungle at 5 a.m. Um, you know, it'll be 100, 110 degrees at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but at 5 o'clock in the morning, it's 50. Oh, wow. Yeah, so these shallow rivers uh, cool off significantly. They're down into the, the low 70s first thing in the morning, and then they're up into the middle 80s later in the day. And I have found fish doing just fine in 95, 96, 98 degree water, hmm. uh, especially little tiny fish. Uh, where the Rio Bronco comes into the Rio Negro, uh, there's a whole little series of really cool islands that have a uh, uh, really big footprint um, okay. before you get to the island itself. So a um, hundred yards away from the island, it's maybe waist deep, whereas another 20 yards away from there, it might be over your head. And from that waist deep water up to the island, uh, as it gets continually shallower, it gets warmer. And in the the half inch inch water, right up tight against the shore, there are thousands and thousands of fry. Um, ah. Triple fry, tetra fry, all catfish fry, everything living in this hot, warm, uh, there's algae growing on the sand. That they're probably feeding on. There's probably biofilms and things like that. Um, plus, there's all manner of detritus and debris that washes up on there. So it's an ideal nursery for these little baby fish. Plus, hot water contains less oxygen. And if you're only this big, you can do well with a couple ppm of oxygen. Yeah, it's a safe. It's a safety. Yep. If you if you're three feet long, you've got to have nine or ten ppm of Oxygen keeps the water boiling up. And uh, so, you know, these low oxygen environments, um, we forget that they act as, as protective nurseries for a number of species, shrimp especially, millions of shrimp, millions. You know, doing the, with the, the little uh, chile, and uh, it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, I like my shrimp. I got lots of shrimp. Yeah. And uh, it, if you, I guess to go back to one of your original uh, uh, original uh, questions, and your answer was about biofilm and whatnot. If you want to learn about biofilm, just get into shrimp keeping. If you're not able to grow biofilm, you will not be successful with your shrimp. Bottom line, that's all they eat. Yeah, and um, with a lot of plecos, if you don't have the right biofilm, it's the difference between a 30% survival rate and a 99% survival rate. You know? Yep. Yep. Especially, yeah. yeah, you have to have lots of stuff in their tank that can grow biofilm. And uh, I think it just keeps their digestive systems going. Well, you know, the most important, one of, I think one of the most important aspects of fish keeping is the interrelationship between all the critters that you know, bacteria and, and other little animals, who knows, and I'm not even sure about keeping that. Necessary to a healthy environment. Um, all these things are working together to help me balance. And um, I tried to, when I had my stores, I used to give away bags of dirty water to people in order to get their, their tank uh, jump started. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story. Guy comes in and goes, I need some of those drops to put in your water. What do you mean drops? Because on my water body, I can't get it clear to go. You don't need drops. You go over, like, squeeze some dirty filter on. I say, can take this home. And he goes, this is a joke, right? I go, no, just try it. He goes, come on. He goes, just try it. Two days later, he comes in and he goes, I thought the bottom fell out of my fish tank. He goes, I get up this morning. It's crystal clear. He goes, what's in this? Is it magic? I go, it's nature. I said, yeah, it's magic. <laughs> Yeah, seasoned, seasoned sponge filters. If I owned an aquarium shop, I would sell seasoned sponge filters. 
You wouldn't build a buy, you wouldn't be able to buy one new off the shelf. You could just get a seasoned one, and you'd well, have to buy one with a tank. <laughs> that's exactly what I did. You could buy, uh, you could buy a, a sponge holder from me for fifteen dollars. For twenty dollars, I would swap that sponge for a healthy, for five dollars more, for a healthy functioning sponge in one of my tanks. And yep. A lot that's of people didn't. A lot of people didn't get it. That how valuable that dirty sponge is. You know, yeah, it's crazy valuable. So what do you got in your tank behind you, Jim? Uh, one of our viewers wants to know what you got going on behind you there. Well, these are my son's tanks. Okay. We have, um, uh, we've got a t the middle tank is full of celestial pearl daniels. We've got uh, populations of pluckos. We've got white clouds. We've got forcata rainbows. We've got um, uh, Montezuma sword tails. They're probably... And probably 50 betas. Oh yeah, and some uh, some of those uh, transgenic zebra daniels. I'm fascinated with that. I don't I, I don't know how I feel about them. You know, um, they are ornamental. Yeah, and they I mean they really are impressive. But I like nature. I mean, we have cardinal tetras in there too. Um, Nature's amazing. Our cardinal tetra is such a dynamite animal. I mean, it will be hard to design a more beautiful fish. You know, that beautiful green, red, green, blue stripe with a bright red. Stripe. Oh my God, you know? And a, a few of those is psychedelic. And, uh, you know, it's um, these creations that we do, some of the hybrids that we've created transgenic fish are pretty amazing and I'm of mixed emotions about them um, I mean I love nature but man I, I've seen old peacocks that just make me cool just like wow you know this fluorescent blue and purple fish uh, right and 15 years ago if you went on any cichlid forum and said that you liked OB peacocks You'd have, you'd pretty much get uh, shot. Like it was, uh, it was a uh, the 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 purists would uh, just uh, annihilate you. But it seems like views have changed a bit. Well, it that's true, and I hope I have been a little bit uh, of that change. We had a huge fight at one of the ACA conventions, and they said no hybrids. And I said, wait a minute. You're allowing a pistogram of cockatoids, you're allowing gold severum, you're allowing oscus, you're allowing discus. Those are all hybrids. Oh, no, they're not. You don't know what you're talking about. I go, yeah, I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> and, um, I mean, the gold severum was developed through a hybridization of a Peruvian severum and a Brazilian severum. Um, I, I know the guy did it down in Florida. And... Uh, at, at that time, in his tent, we thought they were all several. Now we realize that what we thought was one species is 12 species. But there are a, were a number of, of what we now consider hybrids that, and look, I mean, look at sword tails and, and, and uh, bodies. Those are all hybrids. So I don't see what the big discussion is. You can't sell a hybrid as a pure species. I'm totally against that. You know, you got to call them up, come on. But, I mean, look at that, that silly animal, the Labradoodle. You know, Labrador and a poodle. I mean, really cute dog. They're a hot item. And, and, I, and I guess that brings me to this statement. Your average family person that owns one fish tank and they're getting a fish tank because their kid wanted to get a fish tank or right. whatever, are your biggest customers. Hobbyists, like purist form hobbyists they're not your biggest customer it's the people that are going to come in and buy a brand new tank and da, 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 da. they don't care they don't care if it's a hybrid they look at it and go that one's pretty can i keep that one in that tank they, exactly. they, they don't care where it came from its origins anything they just want it to look pretty in their tank so if that's if that's what you want that's what you want i don't see any harm in it well you bring up a, 
uh, something that reminded me of something. Um, I had a good friend that owned Longhorn Steakhouse. Now I'm talking to the aquarium uh, shopkeeper. Uh, he said to me, I went to his, his uh, restaurant, and I said, Joy, and he goes, Jimmy, I don't just sell the steak. I sell the sizzle. And in any business, you've got to have some sizzle. So when I was in my store, whenever somebody would want to fish, I would try to expound upon where that fish originated, where it came from, whether it was man-made or whether it was caught in the wild or, or his parents were caught in the wild. Um, very few people realize the yellow did it. Flying cold, yellow did it, yellow did it. There's only been 19 of those ever caught. 19. Uh, the first two that were ever caught were shipped to Sweden, given to Pierre Bouchard. Pierre bred them on the lakes of Lake Tanganyika and sold them as Libidochromus tangenica, which blew everybody's mind. We said, there's a Libidochromus in Lake Tanganyika? No. There's a Libidochromus in Lake Malawi that made its way to Lake Tanganyika by way of Sweden. But uh, and he, Pierre, I was a good friend with Pierre, real character. Um, he bred over 10,000 of those before he released them to Harvey. But it is a rare fish. First of all, it comes from 100 feet down. And 100 feet down in Lake Malawi, it's pretty dark and it's pretty cold. And you don't have much bottom time. So a lot of these deep, deeper water fish are underrepresented in the hobby anyway. And uh, a fish that is rare in the, in the wild is even rarer in the hobby. But fortunately, we found that they were easy to breed. And millions... There's probably Whoa. more. There's probably more in captivity than there are in the wild. Probably, probably your your next. It's probably your runner up to the guppy for the amount of fish in captivity. It's probably a runner up to the guppy. Like uh, everybody's had a lab. Everybody. It was my first, my very first fish I ever got was a trio of yellow labs, and uh, beautiful animal. Beautiful animal. So what is your favorite fish, Jim? That's like asking who my favorite kid is. Um, <laughs> my favorite kid. We all have favorite kids. <laughs> well, you know, um, so I, I love uh, Neolamprologus uh, bruschidae, um, or, or the daffodil. Uh, I love that fish. It's a long, long, long fish. But the cardinal tetra, man, I mean, uh, you get a hundred of those in a fifty-five gallon tank, and it's just like, wow! Uh, now, do you like the Cardinal Tetras just because of what they do for the hobby? No, no. no when, okay. I, when I first went down to Brazil, um, I had a I had a really difficult time keeping Cardinals. I would buy them from the wholesaler. I'd buy a hundred wholesaler, and I'd end up with twelve of them. And couldn't figure it out. And I, I was doing everything right. So I was doing everything right. The Tetras weren't being treated properly in the way to make. So by the time I got them, they were on their last legs. Um, when I started dealing directly with South America, I ended up with a 98 to 99% survival ratio out of the water. Oh, wow. My secret was I would put them into rainwater and I would feed them um, newly hatched brine shrimp uh, that was that I had put vitamins in and uh, uh, a yeast supplement to put the uh, uh, shrimp to feed on for an hour or so before I would feed them to the baby, to the, uh, the young cardinal tetras. And I got a, I had a, I sold 180,000 cardinal tetras in there. Jeepers. Yeah. Jeepers, that's a lot. Um, second part to this question was, uh, is there any fish that are easier to catch in the wild compared to others? Now, obviously, yes. But what would be the most uh, the most difficult fish to collect that you were trying to collect and were successful? Well, um, my dad was a big fisherman. And he, he fished with... Um, uh, a bunch of really famous people 
for salmon and trout and all that. And he did not understand my fascination with the fish hawk. And he kind of looked down on people that fished the nets. He thought it was cheating. To me, um, I don't call it, uh, I like catching fish. I don't like feeding the water with a, with a stick and a, and a piece of line, trying to hope a fish comes near me, you know? Give me a hundred foot, hundred foot long, four foot high seine, and I'm happy because I can get all kinds. Of now that said, there are certain fish that are way harder than those to catch. Um, the bottom of a average South American river uh, looks like a teenager's uh, bedroom. It's just full of junk, down trees and and rocks and bushes and. Um, it's very hard to, to drag a hundred foot seine across. Them. So you got to get down with hand nets, uh, mask and snorkel. And um, my friend Scott and I, Scott Dowd, worked up uh, protocols for fixing like pluckos. One time we saw this beautiful orange friend pluckow. And uh, I saw Scott pushing down. He pushed, pushed down. He goes, and I looked in this beautiful pluckow. So I swam down and into the front of like sorry, I'm right now in front of the uh, camera, and I did this to the pluck up, and I could see his eyes swivel forward, stop focusing, swim down from the back and grab them. <laughs> so you need some teamwork. Yeah, you do need some teamwork. And is that uh, an L one oh six you're talking about, an orange scene? Uh no, this was a um a hypostomus with a oh, okay. uh, with a bright orange Trim to the dorsal and the uh, uh, the caudal. Uh, oh. Not not a fish that was really commercialized that I'd ever seen. We found it in one river uh, in the Rio, off the Rio Negro, and uh, is now living at Newman Aquarium. Uh, we got home. Um, so yeah, I guess a lot of the bottom dwelling species would be her because like sometimes there's like a couple of feet of leaf litter and whatnot in the bottom, right? Like if they dive into that, you're euchred. Well, when you, uh, we, uh, we use um, Memphis line and twine uh, as our resource for fishing nets, and they sell a humming net, which is the, for the quarter inch mesh, which is the perfect net for catching minnows, and our aquarium fish are basically minnows. And uh, when you take that net, you dip it into the leaf litter and pull it up. And then you go off to the side and you sort through the leaf litter. You're finding knife fish and banjo cats and epistogrammas and all these other fish living quite happily among this leaf litter. And um, I'll tell you something interesting. When we were in uh, Peru, we were doing a survey of the river bottom. And according to our sonar, the river was about 60 to 70 feet deep. And the guy brought down the, the, in 89, we had a radar unit that we used in conjunction with it. And we realized that the river was really 130 feet deep. Oh, wow. And most of what we were seeing was a reflection off of a layer of down trees, leaves, God knows what else. We sent a remote camera down and it's a different world down there. When we, uh, Scott made a small otter call, which for those people who don't know, it's used for catching codfish in wind. And it's got what we call doors that are made out of plywood that when you drag this behind you, the doors open up like a funnel and uh, hold the net open so that it can snag whatever's in front of it. Okay. And, um, the very first time we use it, we found five new species. Hmm. Very good time. Um, there is so much down there in deep water um, habitats that we've never seen because it's so inaccessible. Um, on our on our trawls with our auto trawl, we would sometimes get a twenty minute trawl and sometimes a three minute trawl before it hung up on something. Uh, I catch a tree. Anything. Yep. Um, but what's down there is catfish with 
little catfish this big, maybe six inches, with 12 to 14 inch long uh, and billas and, and oh wow, the fins. absolutely gorgeous, absolutely. Wow. Um, little tiny uh, rhino, rhino rhinchus, little tiny catfish with a, a like a nose like a rhinoceros. Um, and they'd only in the museum collections, there are only two specimens in any museum collection in the world. And we brought up we brought up two specimens on our very first crawl. So wow. it wasn't the thing was that rare, it was that hard to get. Um, going back to the question about what fish are easy to catch, um which looks like a high lie uh, net. I don't know if anybody's familiar with high lie, but it, it's a uh, oval net, minus needle mesh, and a crossbar across it, about a third of the way up. And what you do is you, as you pet, you pet a lot, a tiny about canoes. These canoes are like six feet long. They're made out oh. of a chunk of a tree. Yeah. And um, they, they paddle along and they, they have a uh, collecting bucket in front of them, which is a shallow uh, 12 inches high, six inches deep uh, molded plastic bucket stack or tray stack. And it's got about an inch of water in it. So they would um, use a hopper shape to they creep up onto a school of cardinals and slide the hopper shape underneath the school and then lift it up and take a small net and catch the cardinals out and put them into their collecting container and then let everything else go. It's a great way of harvesting a fish. And they could easily catch a thousand to three thousand cardinals a day. For which what they would got. they get paid per cardinal? One penny. One penny. One which penny. Ten dollars a thousand, which was five times more than the average person got in the Rio Negro. Oh wow! So the but fishermen, they're they're very limited to a season as well. So what is the what's the season for going out and collecting fish there? There's there's low low water season. Uh, at the end of the at the end of the rainy season, as the waters are coming down, uh, the fish are becoming more concentrated and are being fed upon by predators. So, um, I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but 34 to 36 million cardinals a year are shipped out of the Rio Negro, with no diminution of the resource. That's a lot of fish. It sure is, and. Um, uh, most of these fish, or probably 80% of them, would be dead anyway due to the shrinking of their habitat. So you're go when you're going out into the forest looking for these things, there. When it's at high water, forget it. You're not you know, the the cardinals are 100 yards apart. You know, one cardinal. But as the rivers start to drain down, they tend to concentrate into family groups. Of, um, three or four adult, you know, inch and a quarter long cardinal, 15 to 20, what we call a medium cardinal, which is three quarters to an inch, and then 15 to 20 small cardinals, which were much smaller. Now, this is unlike most other schools of fish that I've seen, are all one size. Uh, you know, uh, in um, Belize, I saw schools of Mexican tetras, and they were either an inch long or they were a little over two inches long. And these were different year classes, but they all hung out with their buddies. They didn't hang out with, you know, mom and dad or the uncles. They all hung out with their, their siblings. And the cardinals aren't like that. The first time I saw a cardinal tetras, it looked like I thought I was seeing a reflection from the sky, from the stars coming up. It was, it was maybe quarter to six, getting dark. I had my headlamp on, and I looked down. And I could see the spot here and there of the cardinal tetras. Striking fish. You wonder what 
advantage it is to being having a neon stripe running down the bottom. But I think it'd be easier to see. There's a number of species that I uh, like that. And it must be the Rio Negro looks like Coca Cola. Just black. It varies from weak tea to Coca Cola. And um, in some places, um, uh, I was down there with this guy, Todd, and he, he and I decided to. Uh, there was a uh, stream bed that had recently gone empty. And we decided to dig down and see how deep the leaf litter was. So we got down six feet and we're still digging leaves. And undecomposed leaves. Because uh, the water is so acidic, the bacterial decomposition is really slow. So the only decomposition is by fungal decomposition. So you get a lot of uh, dime to quarter size pieces of leaf everywhere and packing down like shingles on a roof and um, I mean God knows how many feet there are. I heard in Peru one time I talked to a geologist there. he said where we're standing right now we were in the Rio Napa he goes is approximately 300 feet of mud holy before cow we to, before we get to any sort of rocky uh, kids in Peru have never seen a rock. Really? Yeah. Yeah. In some parts of Peru, they've never seen a rock. Just mud. Just mud. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's something you don't think about. It's it's everything there is again. It's wood, mud, they, um, you know, or, or parts of an animal. And uh, I couldn't imagine that. I live right on the edge of the Canadian Shield. So it's, 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 it's all we have is rocks. We, we don't have much mud. It's, right. it's the opposite. Yeah. Can you imagine 300 feet of mud? How many millennia did that take to lay down? Yeah, we nothing like um, that here. Yeah. Um, we should briefly touch upon water in South America. Uh, yeah, by all means. As I've said before, uh, I've had people come in my store and they say, well, I keep South American fish. And I go, that's a pretty broad brush of pink. Um, the main channel of the Amazon coming out of uh, the mountains, the Andes Mountains, the alkalinity and the pH are both very, very high. In the Rio Yuca Ailey, I recorded pHs of 8.6. Oh, wow. The typical, typical pH was over 8. Uh, the water, we call it white water. Um, it's relatively hard. It's uh, six to eight degrees of hardness, uh, alkaline, um, uh, very high, you know, good buffering. And the primary productivity is sound. There are floating meadows and uh, it's like the, um, looks like lettuce, like, like um, no main lettuce, growing that grows on the top of the water coming up. And there's also these huge islands of water hyacinths. Uh, okay. Underneath, underneath these floating islands, all manner of animals that you don't find in other places. So these alkaline waters are coming, they're, they're being uh, caused by the mountains eroding and adding the minerals to it. But the tributaries flowing into that uh, high alkaline river system are generally low pH. So we would go up these little tributaries and 100 yards away from the main river where the pH was 8.4, we would find pHs of 6. Uh, That's crazy. Yeah. And what's funny is where the these rivers run into the main rivers, the dolphins hang out because any fish that washes out of a pH of 6 into a pH of 8.4 oh. isn't having a very good time for a few minutes and they get disoriented. And uh, uh, the dolphins are right there to catch them. And you see there's a number of fish that will actually migrate up and down into these rivers uh, during the day and they're adapted to pretty wide 
pH changes, but it still screws them up for a few minutes. Is there a lot of geophagus up it, up that way? Oh yeah. yeah. I would assume because they are a very tolerant fish, a very very tall. I, like if you're killing geophagus, you're you're really screwing up. Like they they're a very tolerant fish. They are, but they're very susceptible to bacterial diseases. So you got to make sure that you, you feed them a good diet and uh, make sure that the uh, bacterial level in their water is not very high. Yeah, uh, clean water. They demand clean water, but they don't care about pH. You, no. You can, do a, you can do a pH change of a couple pH points, stuff that would stun a lot of fish into immobility. They don't care. And, uh, uh, same with um, Acarictes heckeli, uh, which is a GFA gene. Uh, that's another fish that liked it, didn't really care about pH, but except when it came to breeding. And uh, when it bred, it wanted soft, acid, hot water. It bred in at 88 degree water. Uh, <laughs> and I found a number of fish in the Rio Negro uh, that really required a jolt of, of at least a short period of time to really heat. Which brings up a, a point that a lot of people don't realize. If you're keeping shingle plus, the shingle is not your normal river. It runs 85, 90 degrees for much of the year. And, uh, my good friend Steve Lundblad of uh, West Park, um, out in Oregon, Washington, Steve's a, Steve's a real good guy, very knowledgeable. He came to me when I was running my wholesale business. He said, he said Jim, what is it with um, uh, gold nuggets? He goes, I can't keep them. I get them in them for a week or 10 days, and then they start dying. And I said, what do you keep them? He goes, oh, you know, 75, 80 degrees. I said, no. no, no. I said, raise it 10 degrees. He goes, really? I go, Steve, try it. I saw him the next year. He comes by. Move some people aside, come over and shakes my hand. He goes, My God, you saved me about ten thousand dollars last year. He goes, That was all oh. was raising the temperature and survival tripled. And um, uh, it's yeah, they there's a number of fish that water parameters are less important than temperature. And there are other fish that water parameters are much more important than temperature. Um, Nature is an interesting uh, thing to, to deal with. No matter, no matter what, thing you, you know, what kind of fish or animal you're dealing with. Nothing, yeah, we try, to, we try to recreate all these different themes in our aquariums and, and give our fish what we need. And it's really hard to do, actually. It's hard to keep up with where all your fish come from when you like I got like 25 tanks sometimes I got to remember where where my fish actually come from but they all have a very specific uh, niche we'll say yeah. like and their, their behavior is really influenced on the other species you keep in the tank whether they come from the same area or not I had a very biodiverse 72 gallon bow front i still have it it's right beside the tank i showed you earlier um, but i used to have uh, geophagus tapajos in it uh two breeding pairs in there and i had uh, fisher's woodcats i still have them in there and uh a trio of l128s and a couple of l106s nice. so i still have the l106s the l128s and the fisher woodcats in there and they get along great. I had to get rid of the geos because the Fisher woodcats would never come out with the geos in the tank. But they absolutely do not care about the L128s. So I was trying to do like an Amazon tank, which I nailed it for species, but but they, they wouldn't get along in the in the same biotype. So that's something else you have to think about too. Just because they all come from one area doesn't mean you can still put them all together and they'll be comfortable with each other. Well, you bring up a very cogent point. Um, I discovered that if you keep fish together, that evolve together. And I don't just mean fish in South America. I mean fish in the Omega, in a given habitat. You put those fish together, they just do better than if you have a Noah's Ark 
of fish from Asia and Africa and South America all living in the same glass box. But they've evolved together. They've learned how to communicate and interact in a much deeper way than, than we understand. And um, you have fewer diseases. You have just fewer problems to keep fish that that came from the same area evolved together. Um, I'm convinced that there's some of the Indians in the small ponds sitting on the to mix fish from all over the world together. Um, in my uh, wholesale fish room, my, I would bring in fish from Asia. They were on a separate system uh, about 15 feet away from anything from South America. And I would, I had separate grain hoses for the two systems. I would never use the same hose to go from one system to the next because I'm paranoid. You know, there are, there are things that are relatively innocuous to one animal that can kill another. Uh, you know, we see that in pluckos. We see that in, uh, in discus, you know. We see obviously. that in people. In people, yeah. And uh, uh, wherever that island is, there's an, an island, I don't know, South South Pacific. And they, they had never seen, like, just normal, like, people, any other people other than their tribes. And they were little people. And, you know, like us white people came in and tried showing them how to live the life, right, when they're perfectly freaking happy all on their own. And uh, just from sharing like a candy bar or something, they killed half the tribe because there was microbes and bacteria on that that they had never, ever seen before in their life, right? It killed like half their tribe. So, yeah, something coming from Asia, a fish from South America or Central America and vice versa would maybe not have the immunity immunity to tolerate that being wild caught now if it was a, a tank raised variety i don't think it matters it's probably been exposed to just about everything going anyways but yeah a, a, a sensitive wild caught variety for sure well you you bring up and i just thought of something that you reminded me of um i went to malaysia and i visited a discus farm and they change all of their water twice a day Oh, wow. Their discus are kept under pristine conditions. They were beautiful, fat, healthy, and a delicate hot house flower. They, I, I would bring them in, and they would be fine for two weeks, a month, and then they'd start going downhill. Because the bacteria levels that I was keeping them in were probably 100 times higher. Because I wasn't changing all of the water twice a day. I was changing all the water once a week. And uh, I buy fish from Vietnam where they are kept in ponds with koi, or I buy fish from Germany where they keep 100 adult discus in a 100 gallon tank. And those fish are much more used to life in that ponds. Uh, you know, people think that giving an animal ideal conditions. Uh, the best thing for that animal. But that's not true. You know, you stress is a killer, but it also, you know, the old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's very true. If, if an organism is not, not exposed to enough, like kids, if kids are not exposed to the right bacteria when they're young, they end up developing asthma. The kid that eats dirt never gets sick. There's a zero correlation between asthma and farms. If you grew up on a farm, you don't have asthma. What, what is it? Is there a magic thing about a farm? No, it's that we're, we're animals. We're part of nature's um, uh, population of, of animals. And we need the interaction of all the other life to, to be healthy. You know, so I'm you were... Oh, sorry. I'm Go ahead, Jeff. I'm years old right now. And... Um, uh, I eat properly. I take uh, I eat yogurt. I, I try to, you know, I, I limit grains. A lot of, I eat 10 servings of food a day. 
and I bring that philosophy into my fifth school. You know, I give them a good variety of um, uh, food. I look for the clean water, but I don't spoil them. You know, uh, when my baby, when I'm raising fry up, uh, I view, according to the Asians, I should be changing water every day. But I don't. I change water once a week. Because I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't want to get too comfortable, so to speak. You know, you, you, I need a fish that I can sell to somebody. And he's going to uh, you know the fish keepers, the fish seller's prayer, by the way? Please, God, let it die somewhere else, preferably of old age. <laughs> right and, now um, I think what happens a lot of time too Jim because some breeders I think uh, bring it on too like myself I'm I'm guilty as charged so say my, my clownfish fry I'm breeding I change the water every day Yeah, is the next person that gets them going to do that probably not and I probably won't change it every day as they get older but exactly. if Sometimes you, you have to, to to make things happen, and if you don't uh, bring them back to, I guess, how everybody else is going to care for them after you're done with them, if you don't give them, like you say, a little bit of stress, then uh, they, they're probably not going to do well. They're probably not going to do well at all. They're, they're going to be too accustomed to, to uh, perfection. Yeah. I had a girlfriend like that one time. She was really <laughs> high maintenance, man. <laughs> And, you know, it was wasn't what did you do for me today? What did you do for me this hour? And uh, you don't want your fish like that, you know. <laughs> you want to be able to throw a little flake food in there if you're in a hurry and not have them end up dead at the end of the, the day because they've never seen flake food before. Um, you know, I, so you were talking about quarantine. Oh yeah. Um, when you were, uh, or if you still are doing the uh, the wholesale. Uh, fish business how long would you quarantine fish for this is a a topic that i i've received many many different answers i've gotten answers from veterinarians breeders everything what's your answer 10 days 10 days 10 days i do a, a week of treatment and this is important you can't use a shotgun to treat fish uh you have to know what the fish is probably going to have. For instance, you bring Corydoras in. They, Corydoras exude a, uh, a poison through glands under their pectoral fins that does something to them. So the first thing you do with Corydoras is you bring them in, you put them in a net, and you rinse them off. It sounds crazy. But it will double your stop rate. Then you put them into a clean tank and you hit them with some sort of antibacterial. I use Melifix. I really okay. Like um, but if I bring in um, uh, cardinal tetras, I treat them with formaldehyde and malachite green because they often are carrying uh, hitchhikers. In some cases, stuff you can see. In most cases, stuff you can't. Uh, right. And... Uh, uh, a really good way to kill plecos is to treat them with antibiotics. It is, yeah. They'll look perfect and be dead in two weeks, you know, um, because you're killing all the, the beneficial bacteria that are really doing the, the digestion of whatever they're eating. So you, you've got to know your fish. You've got to know what to treat them with. Um, and the only thing that uh, is going to guide you is experience. And I've unfortunately killed a lot of fish, but I've probably kept millions, literally millions of fish. And you know, my survival rate in general is well in ninety percent range on most of the fish I caught. Now, oh, that's pretty good for an import. Yeah, uh, let me tell you about a, a fish that we wanted to commercialize. Uh, Biotechus opercularis is a little like a miniature yellow perch. Uh, beautiful fish, purple. It's a little cichlid. Uh, quite abundant, but it's not in the hobby. And why is it not in the hobby? Because when you catch it and put it into your collecting bucket, 
within eight to ten minutes, it's upside down and going, ah, I'm going to die. I don't like it here. So we shipped 500 of them, 450 to 500 of them back the first year that we collected them. And we ended up with one, one driver. Um, it was just wholesale destruction. And we went, ah, I'm not going to do that again. So the next day I went down there and I tried packing fish on the boat like we, like I would for shipping. Okay. And, and all that. And, well, and uh, within 24 hours, I would have you know, 25 to 30 percent of them dead. And in another few hours, a lot of more. Of them so uh, I had brought some liquid Valium with me to try to uh, crank these fish. I tried MS222 and I tried Quinobane. And liquid volume worked the best, but it was most expensive. But we would catch the fish and put them right into the bucket with liquid volume. And we all of a sudden, it was like, la, 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 la. You know, and they'd wake up in Boston going, wait a minute, I'm not in Kansas anymore. And uh, they'd be fine. But they so would get stress, stress, is that what you think? Yeah, just like you've probably been fishing with minnows and you put the minnows in and few minutes later there's one of them spinning around doing well that's just stress i mean you didn't injure that minnow you didn't hurt that minnow but they, just, you know, they get that cortisol gets wound up to a point where it's just doing bad things to that animal and if you can reduce stress so we brought back as our test batch we had 21 fish and we brought back one more alive and oh scott, very good scott put him at the aquarium and two weeks later they bred so obviously that was the way to go. You know, crank the hell out of them, and uh, you know, basically, from the time you catch them to the time you they get back into Boston, they got to be tranquilized. Huh, that's crazy. That's good thinking to think of doing that because yeah, fish when fish are stressed out, they don't want to eat. They lose their color when they're stressed out. They're yeah, it's clearly does bad things for them same as it does for us so stress is not good for overwhelming stress it's not good for human Absolutely. beings either so well, I, noticed, I noticed a long time ago that a fish swimming upside down is probably a bad thing uh, yeah <laughs> you know? and uh, uh i could tell that these fish were very unhappy after being caught and i thought it was maybe from the action of the net or, but it was none of the above it was strictly chemical you know you, you give them some uh, you know doggy downers and uh they were like la 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 i'm fine now <laughs> and yeah um, that's, that's amazing was there other fish you had to do that with because i do know a lot of uh hemi ancestors hate stress same as there's a question up coming up here about uh about zebra plecos i'm going to ask you but but i do know that yeah yeah l L, uh, uh, what the hell are they? L 47s, L 46s, sorry. Uh, zebra plecos. They hate stress. I have not, I don't have them myself right now, but I do have some close friends with them and they've never had success with them until they've had their tank set up for like a year and didn't move it. Nothing else kept good water, good feedings. It took at least a year for them to even settle down for the fact to breed. And I think that's due to stress, stress of changing their habitat, where where their tank is, everything else. But the question we have is, uh, Jim, do you think zebra plecos need a jolt of heat to trigger spawning? Oh, absolutely. Um, the first time I ever bought uh, zebra plecos, I was on the banks of the shingle, and there was a fisherman there, and he had a box with me. And I said, how much for the zebra pleco? He said, uh, $50. I said, that's too much money. And uh, my guide said, Jimmy, he means for the whole box. So it cost me $3 a piece for zebra pleco. Oh. <laughs> nice. Yeah, this was in 1993. Um, I brought in, I used to bring in a lot of zebra, and I would sell them for. Fifteen to twenty-five dollars a piece, and wow. people would have 
mixed results with it. My lawyer decided to attempt to breed him. So I sold him uh, a dozen fish, put them in a 125 gallon tank with a large power filter, an aqua clear power filter on the end. I ran the, the intake tube down to the bottom and then ran a PVC all the way to the other end. So I'm sucking water from one end of the tank and dumping it back on the other. So I had laminar flow through the uh, system, uh, 92 degrees. And oh, we, had wow. babies, we had babies at, at four months. Oh, now, wow. The tank we used was not a new setup. It was uh, an existing Geophagus tank that we emptied out. And all we had swimming over them were some um, uh, striped silver dollars. That was it. Um, hmm. And they did great. Uh, but they, they need warm water and they need laminar flow, in my opinion. 92. 92 degrees. Yeah, that's warm. Yeah. Oh. The Shinko's a warm river, very warm river. So you said like 25. Do you know what uh, zebra plecos are worth in Canada right now, in Ontario specifically? Any idea? 100 bucks, 100 bucks an inch. Yeah. Yep. 100 bucks an inch. They're not that hard to breed. But yeah. they're, pain, they're pain in the ass. They're, they're, they don't eat algae. They don't eat grass. They like living stuff like black worms and copepods and um, uh, things like that. I mean, live baby brine shrimp, we fed a lot of. And, uh, I think it would, you know, as it died or it died. It would settle to the bottom, and uh, the, the fleckers would come over and just kill it. You could see the brown dust it 10 minutes after they started to settle out, and uh, within 15 minutes, it's gone. Um, but they don't like light, they like it dark, dark, hot, you know. So, uh, and dark, hot, you're meeting a very meaty diet. Yeah, a lot of the hemi ancestors I find like a meaty diet. My my L one twenty eight, they they go nuts for blood worms or uh, mice shrimps or any even just a yep. chunk of just a chunk of uh, uh, dethawed uh, peeled shrimp. I, I I'll throw I'll throw that in there. Uh, mussels they they like eating it all. You know you bring up a good point. Um, you don't need to feed your fish just fish food. We feed here, my, my, this is my son's setup here. Uh, we feed a large variety of food. We buy frozen mussels. You can buy a, um, a pound of clean, cooked frozen mussels for $4. And because it's a whole organism, it's much more nutritious than um, other, like uh, fish. A piece of fish is not that nutritious. Because it hasn't got everything in it, you know. Inside this little muscle is algae and other things that they were eating when they were cooked. And um, I'm convinced that sort of thing is very efficient for the animal. We feed frozen peas, we feed zucchini, we feed melon. We feed a lot of melon. Uh, cantaloupe. We eat oh, the cantaloupe. Okay. We take the rind and uh, stick a. a Stainless steel nail through it, toss it on the bottom, and the plecos will all pig pile on top of it. There'll be nothing left of that little net on the outside of the cantaloupe. It's all they need huh. to <laughs> Well, it, it, it's true for, you know, when the big craze came on about raw feeding your dogs. Right. About feeding, feeding your dogs raw food. People just started feeding them chicken legs and chicken breasts and stuff like that. They're, they're, they were starting to starve their dogs. Their dogs were not getting the nutrition they needed. So then they would start feeding a little bit of organ meat. Yeah, that would help. But they're not getting – if you're going to do a diet like that, you have to emulate what they get in nature. And in nature, the dogs eat the intestines. They eat everything. They eat yep. it all. And all the nutrients in the intestines and the guts and all the nasty, gross stuff we think – that we wouldn't eat 
that's what gives wolves is what they're trying to say their dogs are my dog's great with imes my dog likes imes he just likes dog food that's got it all in it i'm not going to start raw feeding and trying to simulate feeding my dog the intestines of another animal or something but with fish we can do it with the frozen foods and live foods and whatnot we call it with uh for the rotifers for clownfish gut loading them right. gut loading them putting the nutrients into the guts and that's what gives the baby fry the uh nutrition they're looking for right um well what i do is i always feed the fish my fish the food they like the least first. yeah and um i find that that prepared foods um were very short uh shelf life maybe you want to call it once you put them into the fish tank uh, you know a flake sitting in the bottom probably isn't very nutritious after 45 minutes no whereas, bleached out whereas a slab of zucchini sitting in the bottom would be good at night so um you also have to remember that the reason we cook food is to make the nutrients more available. So I will uh, nuke my um, zucchini for three or four minutes in a microwave until it's uh, cooked enough to sink. And um, it's taking away some, but giving back other nutrients. So See, as I do mine raw, I put mine on a fork raw. I there do something sometimes, but um, you, you will find that the nutritional profile, if you, if you do an analysis of nutrition of, say, zucchini in different stages of cooking, that its um, available sugar profile or something actually changes. And, uh -huh. uh, I mean, there's a reason why we cook food. Um, makes it more digestible for them, I guess, is that? Makes it more digestible for us. Um, there's a lot of plant foods that we that really are not that digestible by us. We have to be cooked. Um, beans, for instance, a lot of beans are poison if you don't cook them. You can get very sick from eating. Uh, I think it's red kidney beans that are not cooked sufficiently oh, okay. to digest the protein. So we have to be, you know, um, natural. In my opinion is better, but I mean, poison ivy is natural. Uh, cyanide is natural. There's a number of things that you don't want to deal with that are all natural. And um, so just because something is natural does not mean it's good. Uh, just because something is not natural does not mean it's bad. But you got to balance everything and think about what um, you're doing to yourself, to your fish, to everything. So. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good spin on it. Uh, and the, yeah, everybody's all natural. But yeah, there's a lot of natural shit that'll kill you. Bottom, <laughs> yeah. Bottom line, you. right? Well, um, sassafras root is a carcinogen. You know, we used to make sassafras root beer. When I was a kid, they still made it. But now they're finding it's got like 12 significant carcinogens in it. You can't use it at all. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, Chewy put up a comment here, and, and I almost actually said something about it before Chewy put the comment up. Is that, like, I've noticed that a lot of people are breeding uh, zebra plecos now. Yeah. Um, this has happened with uh, multifasciatus as well. Um, they have to watch for pug nose syndrome, right? Um, Maltese, mul before people got into all this zebra pleco breeding, uh, Maltese were, like, prime candidate of pug nose syndrome uh where people didn't uh, vary their their colonies very much and uh after a few generations they start getting kind of a punched in face i've actually noticed some people's plecos for sale zebra plecos for sale with pug noses as well so uh i guess people aren't uh uh i guess i'm gonna say diversifying their stock enough would you say that's accurate, Jim? It is. It is accurate, and you're absolutely right about, um, like maybe Eucropius fulvasi and Fulaborni don't have the noses. The ones in the hobby don't have the noses that the wild ones do. 
Uh, the first things, if they're not selected for on a continuous basis, they tend to lose them. And yeah. uh, well, you look at zebra pleckos. The I saw a batch of zebra pleckos that didn't even look like zebras. They had the most wildest assortment of stripes and spots and things like that. And we get that from um, inbreeding. Okay. We get significant things happening. And um, uh, yeah, you got to, that, that's why I'm a big proponent of continually introducing wild blood into existing uh, lineages of cichlids. And you got to, you got to keep renewing the, you know, going back to the original source that we saw. I I look at it as irresponsibility from the breeder. Uh, I do a little bit of line breeding in my fish room, and I do outcross once in a while. Not not very much. I don't. I keep her in house, but. I'm extremely, extremely careful that, so every batch I get now of a certain strain that I've been line breeding to acquire a certain trait, I won't let it out of my fish room until it's, until they're full grown to uh, see if there is any problems. Is there smaller egg bat, is, are they smaller clusters of eggs? Uh, do they have clamp fins? Uh, am I getting pug noses? Am I getting... You know, any, are they pine coning? Are, are we getting shorter fins? Are we getting tattered fins? Are we, there's so many things to look at. Are we getting the color we want? Are they healthy? Are they living for eight months and dying because of some underlying genetic issue? But you compound those genetic issues. Every time you make that family tree more like a stump, you are, you are you are compounding any issues and you're compounding any good things if you're trying to get good traits we wouldn't do it if it was all bad right so yeah. you're compounding good traits but you can also compound poor traits and you can explain this way better than me you know where i'm going with this now um but um, it's irresponsible of people to let those fish out of their rooms that have genetic traits from poor line breeding um, and not calling those fish and some people might think that's mean but you shouldn't let genetically lower quality fish out of your fish room i went to see some front a guy called me up he goes i got a bunch of front so you want to buy them i said how big are they he goes in four to six inches i said sure what do you want from him? he goes uh 10 bucks a piece i said i'll be right over i go over there you know how many i bought none every one was had Y stripes, it had broken stripes, it had pinched in head, junk. Now, you brought up a, an interesting thing that reminded me of something. We discovered that when we breed guppies, that if you line breed guppies for four or five generations, pretty soon the animal you're producing is not as good as the animal you started. Uh, the color might be as the tail might be as good, but the overall size and health and deportment is on down. And what guppy breeders have discovered is they have to maintain two parallel lines of guppies, like red flamingo, and then every so often cross them uh, into each other to maintain the vitality of the overall. And nobody's really sure why this segregation and recombination is working so well, but it is. And um, I have done the same thing with uh, cichlids. I produced a, I line bred a um, colony of purple OB Macapalmus. Um, the, the females were bright orange with black blotches, and the males were blue. And uh, I happened to find a OB male out of, out of one of my early batches. And I bred him back to the females, and I kept line breeding him and line breeding him. But I kept my other colony of more wild stock that I would cross in females to every now and then. And I maintained a very, it took me 12 years, but I ended up with this fluorescent like, purple uh, OB. It was just, oh, I, oh, won wow. best show. I won best of show, best in class, best, I won four awards for this one 
in the one of the ACA conventions. And uh, oh, wow. it's not magic. It's just conscientious looking at the fish, determining what is a good fish and what isn't a good fish. And, uh, you know, you got to keep your eye on the ball. You have to take your emotions out of it, too. You have to, uh, you, I guess, uh, uh, take the blinders off. Take your emotions out of it. Take the blinders off. Look at your fish for what they are. Look at them and go, oh, shit. Maybe they're not as good as what I started with, but I put so much time and effort into this. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Well, that doesn't matter. What what you think of your wasted time or anything doesn't matter. Are you improving the fish or are you not improving the fish? If you're not improving the fish, either outcross or stop breeding and start over. Or, you, you know what I mean? It's uh, You have to look at it. I don't know. You have to look at it, like I said, for, for what it is, look at it in reality without your emotions doing it look at it intelligently and and make a non-biased opinion of your own fish and uh i found some people maybe fall in love with their own fish a little bit too much absolutely yep and uh even if they are shit they they've worked on them and that's their thing it was their project right. for so long but but they've let it go right yep. oh yeah well i we have an angelfish breeder uh, nearby here that produces what charitably could be called short fin angels. Uh, I call them junk. Uh, you know, I mean, that's what I call black know. widow frontosis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of garbage out there. Um, but let me go to the other end of the spectrum. Um, I have caught a number of wild fish. Uh, I caught it. Are you familiar with Guiana Cara? Um, Guiana Cara is a geophagine cichlid that is generally gray with a, a black spot or a stripe in the center of the body. Uh, we caught some in Peru one year that had a red cheek, solid red cheek. I brought him back. I gave him to my lawyer. He was able to spawn him. He probably had a thousand of them in the course of the next two years. We, excuse me. We distributed them widely, widely, and not a single person could do them. Not one. Out of all those fry that we saw, that fish vanished from the captive scene in the field. And another one to be found. I caught Buhukina, uh, this beautiful metallic gold bubukina resembled batata but it was metallic gold gorgeous fish brought them in bred them i sold some to a friend of mine up in canada he couldn't breed them he said i i'm he goes i'm frustrated i'm going to send these back to you i get them back i couldn't breed them either nobody ever bred the fry that i had produced what did i do wrong did i do something wrong with something in there? And the food that I fed, something that nobody knows. I've never, I know a lot of scientists, and nobody's been able to give me a, a coaching answer. It's just something that happens. We, we see it from time to time in the, uh, in the zoo world, too. You get, get an animal in from the wild, it'll breed. But the F1s won't do anything. No. Nope. Generally, it's just the opposite. Generally, the F1 animal. The yeah, animal they're usually eat. a better pet. They're less shy. They're, they're usually just a better pet. Now, do you think that maybe some species of fish or animals, for that mammals for that matter, have like a uh, a low oil light, say a, a low genetics light? Do you think that could happen if, if the uh, genetics are getting a bit close? They just uh, don't have an attraction to each other or... Or, or just, uh, or it, maybe they're infertile, even as uh, as F ones breeding with siblings. That that's interesting. One scientist I talked to said, "Is it possible that the parents got something in the wild, some nutrition in the wild, that enabled their ovaries to mature?" Because he dissected, ah. he dissected some of my animals, and he said 
the ovaries not maturing in these animals. You, know, you get a you get a four inch long fish that should have mature ovaries and they're they're under they're under mature. And, um, and there's no easy way to figure out what is causing it. But mm. you don't know. Yeah, lock locking something. Maybe locking a hormone even. Well, you know, when I was in when I first started working in pet stores, I was like fifteen or sixteen. And by the time I was eighteen, I knew everything that was to know about tropical fish. Everything. <laughs> now that I'm sixty eight years old, I realize I don't know anything about fish. <laughs> you know, I'm just scratching the surface. And well well and you're a scientist. You're you're yeah. you're a chemist, biologist, right? Like you yeah. you 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 kind of know this shit on a different level than all of us to start with. And uh, you still can't explain some things. And, and some things, I guess, just uh, either there's not enough research put into them. Some people might not think they're important enough uh, for big research. Or uh, there's just not an answer to be found. Well, anybody who doesn't believe there's still magic in the world is delusional. There are things that we can't explain. Um, just on, roll with it on small levels on big levels on you know um there's just some things that are unexplainable uh mm -hmm. in our present knowledge and, uh, arthur c clark once said any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic and that's very true but nature has said millions of years to develop her magic and she does and, you know, there are many aspects of nature that I can only describe as magic. Yeah. Magic and evolution, right? Magic and evolution. Evolution does some pretty weird things. How do you get 400 different species of fish in one in one area? You know what I mean? How well, did it, how did African cichlids turn out to be that a lot of the males, some of the most beautiful fish in the world? Almost like, almost like marine fish, right? Right. Deal with high pH, marines high pH. You know, like all these. I think they came from the ocean, personally. But uh, yeah, like there's so many th things. Why did things branch off the way they did? Right. Right. Why are there no giraffes with necks half long? You would yeah. think it would be there would be intermediary. Uh, versions of these of these critters. Right? Uh, why is a neck, you know, 15 feet long, the optimum neck size? You know, why not? Why aren't we seeing giraffes with 20 foot necks and some with nine foot necks? And we don't know. We yeah. don't know why this, why nature chooses to pass to these represent animals. And uh, you know, fascinating world out there, Jesse. It really is. It is, man. It is. I do. I know we're getting on here, and you're probably getting tired, Jim. But uh, you're good. Talk, good, you, good to go. You if you don't stop me, I, I can talk for a week. <laughs> I need some more answers. So uh, back to back to going south, going to Brazil to do a to do a, a, a fish collecting journey. What does one bring to something like this? Your average guy that's never been, like things that you're not going to get there or things that you're really going to need there. What What are you going to bring to something like this? Remember, people in Canada aren't you have never been to a jungle. What uh, What do you got to bring and what do they supply? I guess is where I'm going with it. Uh, bring plenty of deep woods off. <laughs> um, uh, bring a good pair of sneakers that you don't care about. Um, white cotton socks, um, tight underwear. Uh, everybody's aware of Kangaroo. The little uh, those they are everywhere, and you do not want to participate in an inadvertent ammonia releasing event underwater unless you're well protected. It will not, okay. it will not end up well for you. Um, and uh, we, we, the scientific term for them is trichometrids, and they they look like little slivers of glass. And I oh, guess wow. they feel like feel like that when they swim into the wrong orifice. Yeah. 
but generally, that's what you want to do is you want to protect your feet because uh, everything in the, the, the junk, you don't want to cut yourself open underwater. Um, and uh, I always bring a wetsuit um, for a few reasons. Uh, I, I'm in the, where was I? I was in um, the Rio Negro. And I'm floating down this little creek and uh, I got my wetsuit and my mask on. And uh, I come out the end of the creek and I realize I'm in a school of about 50 or 60 foot, a foot and a half long black piranha. And uh, the, the natives call these burro, cast, burro castrata, donkey castrator. So these are, not, these are not a good animal to deal with, you know. Delicious and, and really fun to catch on a hook and line. But you don't want to be swimming with them if you can avoid it. And uh, so with my wetsuit, I was just a big black animal drifting through, and they just kind of looked at me and didn't bother me at all. Um, I was in Peru one time, hot, hot day, 100-degree day. I'm sweaty. I'm dirty. I climb up to the top of the riverboat, and uh, the pool below me was a very pale green color. And the visibility was probably 10 to 15 feet. It wasn't crystal clear, but it wasn't that murky. So I jumped into the, the pool and um, I went down about 10 feet and I opened my eyes as I was coming up and I realized I'm sitting in a donut hole of, of piranha. I had probably 50,000 red belly piranhas surrounding me, all looking in at this thing that went into the water. <laughs> It was, uh, it, it gave me pause for a second, it really did, until I, I realized that, wait a minute, these are red bellies. Red bellies are primarily fish fin eaters. They don't eat the whole fish. Uh, yeah, I just they, clean all their fins right off. They, well, every single Oscar I ever caught had nip fin. Every single waru I ever caught had nip fin. Huh. So the piranha come up, take a bite of fin, the fish swims away, throws his fin back. Nice renewable resource. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, what are but, other What other risks do you have for predators down there? Probably a lot of water snakes, that type of thing. Cayman. Well, um, somewhere I have a slide. Somebody took a picture of me at night um, in the Amazon, and uh, after they developed it we realized there was a 12-foot crocodile right behind me. <laughs> it came out in the in the picture, but I didn't know it because it was so dark. And it was no more, no more than six feet away from me. So do do the locals have problems with predators, or, or are they just extremely careful on what they do? Do they? Well, yeah, how bad is it? We, we found, uh, we, we were at Queens Lake, and we found what was left of Georgie, which was a pile of anaconda poop with his belt buckle on it. Oh, are you serious? That's terrible. Yeah. So you got anacondas. Big, big snake. You know, now, like you'd think you'd snake. see something like that coming, no? Not in the water. No way. Eh? They just go under the black water just enough that you, you can't see them? That's right. So do you have people kind of looking out while people are looking for fish, or do you just go to a general safer area, an area that somebody there is familiar with, or how, how would you go about that? No risk, no reward. Just um, give her. I, I've, you know, I've gone into places that are significantly dangerous, you know. I've been shot at three times in South America. Uh, once by police protecting a cocaine field. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I I was uh, gonna ask that as well. Yeah, like the human risks, uh, oh, a yeah. lot of extortion and whatnot. I'll tell you a funny story. I'm in uh, I'm in Brazil. Um, no, I like fishing. At night. Headlamp, sneakers, shorts, lots of spray, bug spray, and I'll go into the jungle. And I'm down with all these Brits, and uh, 
they weren't so sure they wanted to get out into the middle of the jungle and go wading around in water with various things that could eat them. And uh, I mean, they pretty much thought I was crazy, crazy American. Um, um, so I'm like, well, there's nothing to worry about. So I got my net and I'm, I'm uh, uh, going into this little stream and, lo and looking, you know, getting a net full and sorting through it, looking for what I can find. And I hear this talk. <coughs> and I look up and about 30 feet away, there's a jaguar in a tree. And I go, wow, never see, never see predators like that. Only one I've ever seen in South America. I've seen them in Central America a few times. South America was the only one I ever saw. And uh, I looked up, put my light on him, he's gone. So, wow, that was pretty cool. Now, the boat is right behind me. It's maybe 10 feet behind me. I put my net back down, and I put a net you know, into the leaf litter. And I get knocked on my, on my ass with this tremendous blow to my shoulder. And I'm, I get up and I'm swinging the net back and forth, my heart's pounding, and everybody in the, in the boat, roaring, laughing hysterically. I'm like, what's so friggin' funny? They said, did you see what hit you? I go, I have no idea what hit me. And they said, you spooked a three foot arowana that came up like a snake and knocked you over. Oh I just really? Seeing, seeing something silver coming at me, and uh, I mean, it must have been big. Because it knocked me right on my ass. Oh and, wow! But I had no idea what it was. You know, you know. Well, you can find some, walk coming at me. <laughs> you can find some creepy stuff in the water at night there. I bet. Oh yeah, there are there are catfish that can eat you. Yeah. You know, there, there's a there's a ten foot catfish um, that occurs around there that uh, fishermen disappear all the time. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do. It's not. It would be a risky, a risky job to do every oh, day. Yeah, it, exactly. Um, you know, I, I mean, um, my greatest risks in traveling in the jungle have always been from people, uh, not from the animals. Right. You, you gotta. You know, the humans are definitely the most dangerous animal on the earth. They are, and, and there's some desperate people down there, right? Definitely, just like anywhere, just like anywhere. Although generally, you know, uh, we had people come on these trips with us, and they're going, oh, somebody should do something about these poor children down here, living in poverty and, and not going to school. This other thing. You know, you don't understand. You just you don't understand that. This one size fits all Amer American dream of education and living in an apartment. A lot of people don't want that. These people were well fed, healthy, happy. Um, you know, they didn't have DVDs and, and maybe had a radio. Um, but I mean, it, it, it doesn't require all the, the stuff that we have in Western civilization to, to be happy. And, uh, you know, nothing I says admire. you need to own a car or a, or a television set in order to be fulfilled. You know, they're living in the, if you've ever been to, if you've never been to the rainforest, it's magical. It's like a seed. It's, it's just, it's like, oh my God, you know, it's just it's unbelievable. Um, my girlfriend and I took out that like, so I left before everybody else did. Um, we had a bunch of big river boats, but I always travel in a little two-man canoe because you can travel quieter and you see a lot more. Well, going down this little Clearwater River in Brazil, we saw a fluorescent orange squirrel. Fluorescent, I'm talking pumpkin orange. Ran down the tree and stopped maybe six feet away from us. Morpho butterflies, you know, six to eight inches across. Um, caiman, snakes, uh, giant and um, uh, spiders, uh, bird eating spiders, tarantulas, um, all kinds of cool. I mean, it's a magical place. Really. Yeah, I, I really want to go. I've uh, I've been to 
I've been to the Caribbean, but I've never been to the rainforest. I've been to Cuba quite a few times now, and I love it. I'd love to go backwoodsing through Cuba. Um, but yeah, the rainforest would be definitely, especially with the amount of fish that I've kept from the Amazon. I most definitely would love to go just to see if I can see more. Well, any any form of travel broadens your horizons, and in my opinion, increases your uh, worldview um, and makes you more uh, conscious of other people's desires and, and uh, uh, worldview itself. You know, we, we we in the West pretty narrow viewpoint of what success is and what a happy life is. It's a lot the more model, the, the society model we have. Yeah. Yeah. Conform or you're a loser. <laughs> right? That's what it is. That's bottom line. You gotta take your happiness where you can find it. And happiness doesn't occur in great big chunks, it's like in little tiny pieces. And you know, if you take joy in a sunrise, I'll give you an example. Um, one morning I wake up in the Rio Negro. I'm up on the top deck. It's uh five thirty in the morning coming up um, so I wake up and I felt the call of nature so I hear this splash and I, as I'm getting up I look over the side you know on the starboard side of the boat are uh, two feet off coming up and going back down again and they were like nine feet away from me beautiful animal so I watched them for a minute then I went over to the port side of the boat to relieve myself and I'm looking down and on this piece of driftwood sticking up out of the water is a big praying mantis. And they're a little different down there. They get pretty big. They get like six inches, six inches long. And um, this thing is doing its you know, thing, walking up. And all of a sudden, I see this black arowana come up out of the water, straight up, comes up level with the uh, mantis. And he turns his head, grabs the mantis, right down on it into the water. It was a National Geographic moment. It was awesome. And, you know, that sort of thing, if you just take the time to observe nature, you can do it in your backyard. Um, you know, go out there and, and, and just be, you know, be part of nature. Be, look, look around you and watch the insects and the birds and the, you know, and be very aware of your surroundings, especially if you're in the rainforest or Cuba. I have a bit of a story about almost getting eaten by a, a crocodile in Cuba. So I was on a moped, and I'm blasting around like a dumb tourist. So I go, and I see this uh, older gentleman fishing at the river, and, it, and he's just using a line with hooks, and he's bringing up small, look like freshwater fish. So I... I'm wheeling up, and I, hey, senor, I don't speak Spanish very good. That's like all I know is senor grande. I know different words. But so I walk right up to the river edge, and I'm just looking around like a dumb tourist. He starts freaking out at me, freaking. Grande, senor, grande. He starts laughing like a, like a crop, and I figure it out. Oh, shit, I'm going to get eaten by something here. So... <laughs> I backed my ass up, back to where he was. He said a bunch more things to me. I didn't understand a word of it, but I pretty much, I think he called me a dumb tourist, get the hell out of here type of thing. Yeah. Get it. So I, I go home and research. Yeah, there's this Cuban crocodile that what it does is it they grow to 14 feet, and they launch themselves out of the water and grab birds out of trees and wow. pull them back and then pull them back down into the water so that's what they do with people too they'll grab people and, and just pull it in then you're done you don't even know what happened so yeah that's why i ask about risks and stuff because i know there's risks any any foreign place you go there's different risks and uh you need to be aware of them at, at the very least i was with my friend julian white eagle one time and we were fishing this area called um we didn't know it at the time but it was called crocodile beach you know, they should tell us this before we go fishing. 
So um, it's covered in water. Oh, oh, oh. And uh, Julian and I pulled the same a few times. We caught Actus and Sakalai and um, uh, and uh, a few other signals from Acalonia, NASA, and uh, Ketobrinkopsis. So Julian takes the canoe and goes around this island. And I walk across the island. I got my net over my shoulders. And I'm slogging through a maybe a little over knee deep water, slogging through the uh, water lettuce. And I hear this splash. And I go, Julian, are you? And I look around. And up ahead of me, all of a sudden, uh, the um, water lettuce parts. And it looks like a sewer pipe coming up out of the water. And it's a 14 foot long crocodile. Oh. And the eyes are like this far apart. And uh, I go, uh oh. <laughs> it's maybe maybe 20 feet away from me and it's starting to ease forward. So I'm like, ah, oh, okay. So I start backing up and taking the net off my um, off my neck. And I hear this voice behind me. What are you gonna do with a net, white boy? <laughs> I said, when this croc jumps at me, I'm gonna stuff it down his throat, Indian. And, he, and Julian, one of the bravest men I've ever met. Julian paddles the canoe. Now it's only a little tiny canoe. Paddles the canoe between me and the crocodile and holds his paddle out at the, at the crocodile. He goes, roll in the boat quick. So I roll into the boat and we paddle away. But, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's got, you just have to be careful. You got to be careful. You got to be aware. You know, you can't be stupid. Um, you really got to be careful with alcohol down there. I mean, I realize alcohol makes you better looking and smarter, but, uh, you know. Depends on the company. <laughs> uh, definitely, definitely made some women I met better looking and smarter. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you eat when you're down there on the river boat? Is it like a fully stocked boat or are you, eat, are you catching your supper? What, how, how does that work? Well, I lived on piranha, black beans, and white rice for three weeks. Uh, one of my trips. Um, okay. On, depending on who you go with. Um, I mean, I went down to South America one time for, I, I spent three weeks there for $900. And that included my airfare. Oh, wow. Talk about the cheap sheet, cheap seats, you know. Yeah. There wasn't, there wasn't any money for, you know. Normally we go on a on a river excursion with a professional boat captain who's got a crew and, and all this. And this time we just hired a couple guides and went up into the jungle. Just went backpacking it. Yeah. And when you've been there as much as Scott and I have, you know, you go down there, it feels like home. You know, yeah. it's not like it's not like someplace different. It was like just a you know, like going to your friends house. I was going to say, you probably built a lot of relationships down there. Yep. But, um, yeah, a piranha tastes like trout. Oh, does it? It has that trout tang to it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really excellent fish. Uh, okay. My very first breakfast in South America um, was in Peru, and I get up, and I had there were two turtle eggs and uh, a piranha and yams, uh, not yams, um, um, the uh, banana thing, plantain. Ah, uh, that, yeah. That was breakfast. And I'm looking at it, and uh, with turtle eggs, the, the yolk looks like a golf ball. It's wow. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, these are probably from the Podicnemus turtle, which is highly endangered. <laughs> Piranha, on the other hand, when we would when we would do a, a netting, we would bring up hundreds of pounds of piranhas. Hundreds. Of them. There is no shortage of them at all. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'm in. Uh, I was in Peru with a bunch of uh, biologists at the time, and we're, doing, we're trying to get some sort of idea on the productivity of these rivers. Now, I mentioned before, Peru is whitewater and the productivity is enormous. They put a gill net 
across a river. The river was maybe 300 yards wide, 250 yards wide. It wasn't that big. So we go up to this fishing boat, and uh, the boat is probably 18 feet long and three feet wide. And it's filled past the seats with silver dollars. About oh, jeepers. And that was one night's fishing for two men. So they eat, they eat well. They eat fine. Off, off the land, yeah. Yeah, there's no, there's no protein shortage or anything like that in, in the jungle. Um, there's lots of things they like, uh, coffee and sugar. Yeah. Um, coffee is remarkably difficult to produce on a uh, small basis. You know? Uh, oh, okay. Remarkably complicated. I mean, who would have thought of taking that little red berry and you let the seed, let it rot, and then you clean the seeds off and you dry them, and then you roast them, and then you grind them, and then you pour hot water on them. Who thought of that? I'm glad they did. I love that. But, I mean, that's a lot of work. Oh, that's a big, big business. You're and, saying the small time farmers just can't uh, do the process effectively. Well, I'm not saying farmers in the in the rainforest um, because of the especially in the Rio Negro. The Rio Negro is part of the Guyana Shield, and it's been rained on for a couple of million, a couple hundred million years. Um, and there's nothing left in there. Nothing left in okay. There's there are no minerals left in the water at all, which is why the Rio Negro was so soft and acidic. So you're not going to grow much. You're not going to grow much without without adding stuff to it. So you can grow plantain, you can grow banana. Uh, they they eat bamboo. They eat um, uh, plant, uh, not plantain, uh, 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 mangoes. There's a number of other things they eat, but uh, you know, forget about vegetables. You know? um, there are some wild grass eating things they eat, but um, you know, broccoli in Belize. You could buy a bag, bag of mangoes for the price of one head of broccoli. Oh wow! Yeah. Supply and demand. Yeah, mangoes were like a dime, and uh, a head of broccoli was like four dollars, five dollars, um, hmm. because it doesn't, it doesn't want to grow in the warm climate. And there's a no, lot so of there's a lot of what we think of as uh, normal foods that just won't grow down there. So rice is a big staple. Um, beans are a staple down there, uh, but it's mostly fish. I, mostly fish. I would, say, I would say fish makes up 90% of their protein. Oh, wow. With uh, chickens making up the other 10%. Most, most of the jungle inhabitants have meat once or twice a year. Um, they happen to kill a deer or, or a tapir or something like that. So, uh, no McDonald's, no Burger Kings. They're they're probably extremely healthy people for not uh, eating a Tim Hortons donut every morning or a Dunkin' no Dunkin' Donuts for you guys. Yeah. And uh, you know all the shit we eat up here. Oh, it's terrible. The the processed foods we eat. Uh, it's amazing we're even alive. It really is. You know, um, I won't eat anything artificial. I won't do any artificial sweeteners and any artificial colors if I can help them. Um, being a chemist, that stuff scares the shit out of me. Um, they, when I was in the hazardous waste business, I used to take, I won't say who it is, but we get sued. A certain sweetening company gave me their hazardous waste. And it was so toxic. It was what we call a PIH, which is a poison inhalation hazard. It was so toxic. I had to take it in little 20 gallon sealed plastic drums and feed it directly into my incinerator without opening it. We had to, we had to sample it. When we did up to, when we did sample it, we had to sample it in a, in a room with special ventilation and full Raquel suits on. Oh God. So nasty. And then making an artificial sweetener out of it. No, thank you. 
Yeah, sugar twin and all, and a sweet and low all them. They're, they're, yeah, it's it's pretty much rat poison. They they've proven that it does bad things to the brain as far as you know. You eat something sweet, it tells the body, hey, you're getting some calories coming. You eat something sweet, there's no calories. The body's like, what? What happened? And pretty soon, it doesn't trust its own sensory. And uh, that combined with what I call it toxic hunger. And toxic hunger is a result of eating food that's low in nutrients. Okay. And I have a good friend who he's 12 years younger than me. And when we go out hanging out together, people ask people. Uh, he, he thinks macaroni and cheese on a daily basis. Okay. Uh, and we have children hungry. like that. He's always hungry. He's hungry all the time. And I'm not, I don't eat like toxic hunger is when you, your body is so deprived of certain micronutrients. It's just it's saying, eat, 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 eat. I got to get this, whatever, it is, manganese or molybdenum or who knows, you know. But your body knows when it's lacking certain things. Uh, which is why, with my fish, I'm, I'm so concerned with giving them a, a variety of diet so that I'm not missing something, you know? It you would be a that? lot easier as a chemist to know this stuff. But, yeah, that's a fear I have, too, of, of, of too, cons too consistently feeding the same food to your fish. Whereas, like, even with a lot of my fry, I'll blend, like, five or six different types of dry fish food up together just just in case one's missing something that the other one might have. That's right. Now, I have a doctor friend who has the opposite opinion. He thinks that we eat too much variety and that some of our modern problems are caused from eating foods that went off. And I'm not sure if I buy his argument, but he thinks it's better for the, your digestion to have a consistent diet. But he says that dogs do better on a consistent diet than they do with a wide hmm. I'm not so sure. Um, uh, Purina would have you believe that. Um, at the zoo, we feed a lot of you know, Mickey Chow and camel chow and donkey chow and all these other chows that are designed to be a complete diet for whatever animal to feed. And um, I'm not uh, convinced that it's perfect. I really appreciate the links that Akari and other companies have gone to to produce a well-balanced, well-rounded food for us. And green, but I still feed brine shrimp and blood worms and mussels and vegetables, and a whole variety. Myself, I eat, I eat oatmeal every morning. I try to eat oatmeal every morning. Uh, but I also have plums and peaches and watermelon and oranges and all many of these all day. I've actually started, uh, I, I get an overload of duckweed in a lot of my aquariums because that's what I use to uh, help keep my water good in a lot of tanks. It's a, it's a, it's a great filter is what it is, um, but it's also, uh, and you can, you can add what may be in this that I don't know about, but uh, duckweed is a very nutritious plant, so I actually blender blender down make it digestible and, and uh i dehydrate it actually into wafers uh with spirulina powder maybe some spinach in there as well maybe a little bit of shrimp whatever snails got mixed in with it when i uh collected it and it all gets blended up and then dehydrated into wafers and i i feed a lot of my flacos and whatnot that yeah. homemade food as well that's a great idea i have an israeli doctor friend who is the king of duckweed. And he's developed a number of strains of duckweed. He makes $5,000 a month 
from five tanks with duct tape, going duct tape. How Chambers. You, everybody, everybody's ears were probably lit up on that. He, over 40 years of breeding, he developed duckweed that was high in xylo sugar, which is a left-handed sugar, and he extracts it and purifies it and produces a vaccine adjuvant out of it. Ah. And when you inject it with a uh, with a vaccine, it primes it because it's it's a foreign substance. It kicks off the immune system. It tells the immune system, "Hey, there's something going on here." You know, take a you know, take a look at this, and it looks at the whatever the vaccine is. Goes a bit to it. But he also oh. he also produced a duckweed that was higher in sugar than corn, and he wanted to use it for ethanol production. And you could grow it, you could literally grow it in sewage, harvest it, um, do the fermentation, and produce ethanol. Huh. But guess who shot that down? The U.S. Was government. That? The U.S. Oh, yeah. government. Oh, yeah. The crime wouldn't pay if the government ran it. No, no, no. No, no. no. They, they, oil, they, oil, uh, oil. They are such scumbags. Our, our leaders, especially that moron that we call a president. I get dogs at this <laughs> um, our, our prime minister won't even meet with him on this Wednesday. <laughs> He's a, uh, we're not, I'm not going. What do you dangerous. think? He's yeah. delusional and dangerous. I mean, I mean, I'm amazed. I mean, I have to kind of respect some of the stuff that he's, some of the decisions he's made. You know, we we are mealy mouth uh, to some of our other leaders of the world to the point where you know we we kiss people's asses that we should be shooting, and uh, we have to shoot people that we should be kissing their ass. But uh, you know, he's just on another planet. So, but, yeah, he's different. <laughs> What do you think, uh, Dragon Lair has a question for you. What do you think of Extreme Foods? There's a brand, Extreme Foods. Um, I've only used one of them. And, um, yeah, I mean, my favorite food is made by Ken's Fish. Um, Ken's Fish is a, is a ah, yes. on, online company. Um, I used to sell him fish food years ago. He was breeding angelfish. And he was like, Jim, your food sucks. Ken, what do you want from me? I buy it from Germany. You know, I don't make this stuff. He goes, I'm going to start making my own food. Oh, yeah, good luck with that. Because it's a huge investment making your own food. Well, Ken took the ball, ran with it, and got touchdowns. He produces a flake food now. Uh, I think it's made by the same people at the Mega. And his color max is un, uncomparable to any other um, food I've ever used, except for Akari Red Parrot. Akari Red okay. Parrot. Is a, oh my God! What a what a color enhancing food that. Is. And I don't even remember it. It's got like seven color But Ken is very conscientious. A really good guy, a gentleman, um, and people should check out his foods. Kensfish.com. Um, Ken's fish. Ken's fish. Nice guy. Reasonable prices. Good service. Um, and he sells everything, but his his flake foods and his palletized foods. Um, he's developed with. I mean, he goes down to the University of Rhode Island all the time and talking to the scientists there. And, I mean, you know, this guy, it isn't some backyard operation where, let's throw some peas into this mix, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. Well, so do uh, I. You know, that's, I mean, that's what I do. I'm, uh, not a nutrition, I'm not a nutritional scientist. And, uh, you know, he goes to the he goes to the source and talks to people that, that do this for, you know, been doing it forever. So... You should uh, watch my past live stream with my uh, friend Jeff Mountjoy. Uh, my friend M M uh, Jeff Mountjoy is uh, the the sales manager for Northfin Fish Foods. Extremely, oh, yeah. yeah, extreme. Have you used Northfin? Yes. Yeah. I think it's great food. I use a lot of it. 
and uh, in my fish room uh, it supports local business for me too as it's made in ontario canada um, but jeff is extremely knowledgeable with his food and i think the biggest thing i took from i've heard jeff's talk on uh, fish nutrition before he's he will come to clubs and speak and i think if uh, the most i took from it was his specification of it's much more digestible and palatable for your fish to eat uh marine food over terrestrial food so meaning say kelp um, um snails fish fish meals shrimps that stuff over beef heart chicken uh bananas and so on he says that the the that marine animals and plants it's just so much more palatable for fish than uh terrestrial plants and animals and it makes the proteins uh much more usable for the fish is there um as a chemist do you, do you take stock in that well he's he's right but you have to keep in mind that in the rainforest, um, probably 75% of the nutrition falls on the water from terrestrial sources. Um, there are no marine animals available for them to ingest. We have the advantage of being able to, you know, like a Chinese restaurant, one from column A, one from column B, and end up with a, a food that is actually, in my opinion, sometimes too nutritious. Okay. Uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the food, a lot of the, the stuff in the gut of a fish is non nutritive crap. So keeping everything moving through the system. Um, if you want to kill a tank of tropius, the easy way to do it is to feed them meat. You know, feed them brine shrimp for a couple of weeks, and pretty soon they're, they're getting sick and then they'll start dying. And Part of it is because you can't feed cow meat. You should use it for one cow. But it's also because um, a lot of things I guess they like you can't you not just put meat into a compost. Why? It's not because it won't it won't break down. It breaks down too fast. Oh, okay. So you want to in, in nutrition, you want a combination of easily assimilable um, starches and proteins and stuff that is not so assimilable. They've discovered that in humans, that if we eat starches that are too digestible, our colon is deprived of nutrition and it causes all kinds of problems for especially older people. But if you eat resistant starches, things like bananas and uh, uh, potatoes, as compared to wheat, um, you see oatmeal is another resistant starch. Resistant starch means that it's not all broken down in your mouth and stomach, that a lot of it passes through into your local body, where it's worked off on micro organisms and nutrients that we need. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense that we get a, we have to uh, feed the whole organism. You know, all the way through the whole gut system, and that concentrating on something being digestible may not be the, the be all end all of that food. You know, um, keeping everything moving, keeping everything, you know, uh, flowing through the system. You know, we're we're, a, we're not lakes. We're we're a river. You know, we drink stuff in and we pee it out. We eat stuff in and we shit it out and everything's got to keep moving and if you don't move stuff through your system on a continuous basis you're not going to be healthy and yeah. same with the fish you know huh. that's that's a good way of looking at it <clears throat> i think um i think looking at it from that perspective as well um I guess it depends on, on what the diet is, right? If it's a fish that's a herbivore, an omnivore, or a carnivore, 
on what proteins and, and how they should be getting those proteins. If you have a trophius, which is a, a grazer, grazes all day long, very little nutrition goes in, but lots of it goes in all right. day long. Or a pleco or something like that compared to a frontosa, where it goes and eats a fish. Bam, just got everything all at once. Yep. That frontosa's digestive tract is clearly much, much different than a trophius's. Yeah. You look at a, a Siamese fighting fish, a beta. It's got a real short digestive tract. It eats meat, digests it, and it's gone. Um, it's very, very simple, very quick. Uh, capture nutrients. But this is not a long lived fish. Um, we have pluckos. I mean I had I've had several pluckos that live to be 25 to 30 years old. Um, it appears that a number of these pluckos are animals. So we have to make sure that just like us, um, you know the old joke around here, we're gonna start a uh, asbestos company. Asbestos removal company of old guys because by the time we got cancer we'd be dead <laughs> you know if, if you're an animal that a very short lifespan nutrition is not your be all end all you know you just got to eat enough to stay alive and um if you know there are many uh, insects that their breeding stage they have no mouth parts they can't even eat so um we have to keep in mind what that animal does, how he lives, how he, you know, the long, how long he lives, and fine tune our feeding regimen to that that animal's lifestyle. Um, but this gets to one of my biggest beefs: is that we are capturing animals from the wild that have taken anywhere from five to fifteen years to become breeding size or breeding age. And we're harvesting before that. And uh, the bluefin tuna, you know, for good example, we're over harvesting that because we, you know, we're just so friggin' greedy. And the same thing with pluckos. We're, we're definitely over harvesting pluckos and stingers. Um, yeah, a lot of pluckos have come in small the last couple of years. Yeah. Wild, wild caught pluckos, and I know they're wild caught because they're just not being bred in captivity with enough. Uh, consistency to to be stocked but yeah they're coming in like l128s are coming in at inch and a half two inches right whereas like a oh, while wow, like this is what we should be talking about right and uh yeah they, they are being over harvested for sure or just not selectively harvested enough one or the other i'm not sure well you got to be careful if you just harvest the big ones for instance we have a uh, you know what a striped bass is, right? Um, in Massachusetts, I cannot. Keep, I can go fishing for striped bass, but I can't keep it unless it's 36, 36 inches long, three feet. That's stupid. First of all, a big animal like that is not that good to eat. We should be. We should have what's called a slot limit. That's what we have in Ontario. We you have know, slot yeah. sizes. Yep. I mean, a big, a two foot striped bass has five to 10,000 eggs. A three foot striped bass has five million eggs. Um, which one do you want out there breeding? You know? I'll take this a step further, Jim. With our slot sizes, we have an undersized slot and in the slot and an oversized slot. Same so yep. under the slot, they're not sexually mature fish. They're probably not going to be great breeders and their chances of making it in the wild to be uh, uh, a mature breeding fish, their chances aren't quite as good, so they allow us to keep a couple of them. I'm, I'm talking walleye right now, pickerel as some people call them. So there are sought after fish around here. Right. Um, so you're not allowed to keep any in the slot, which is I believe 16 to 22 inches. You're allowed to keep one under or two under or one under and one over. So 16 to 22 inches, they consider their best breeders, their best breeding size over 22 inches. Maybe the fish is getting later on in life and, or it's a trophy that you would like to 
some people would would like to keep but for the breeding that the prime breeders are between 16 and 22 inches here and uh they they want you to let them go so they can keep breeding well a, a biologist friend of mine that works out of the chesapeake said that we should be doing the opposite slot you know, we should be harvesting all the two foot animals in the hobby and let the big ones go yeah the big ones the, i mean they get to be four feet long of striped bass and oh, wow. when, get, when, when a female hits three feet she is a producer of eggs big time yeah. and one female can easily outproduce 20 small females so those are the, and also if you if you shoot all the the deer with the big antlers pretty soon all the fluff is deer with small antlers and you know, the same thing with with um with anything if you harvest the biggest animals out pretty soon you know you're, you're taking you're, that out of the gene pool yeah you, yeah you're you're selecting away what you the very thing that you want so slot limits make a lot of sense and we mm. should have something similar with Take the big ones. Leave the big ones behind as breeders. And um, in some cases, that's easy. Like, um, who wants to have a three foot um, Acanthicus adonis in the fish tank? You know, a lot of people don't realize they get three feet long. I shipped one out to a zoo one time. It cost me $600 to ship the thing because of the special packaging and everything I had to do. Um, but it wow. was magnificent, you know. Uh, That's three foot, three foot animal with sixteen inch trailers on its fins. Beautiful. Wow. Uh, that is crazy. But I mean, that's the sort of thing that that wasn't going to a private individual. That was going to a rainforest, and I can see harvesting a few individuals. For, for display so people can see what these animals are. You know, um, you know, a lot of people are really against zoos, but so much education that can go on in a zoo. Um, and, you know, after working in a zoo, most of these animals are fine. You know, I had a woman come in my store one time and I said, can I help you? She goes, let me look around for a minute. And she's looking at my tank, and she comes home, and she goes, you know, they told me, but I didn't believe it. I go, what? She goes, you have happy fish. She goes, what? She goes, your fish. They're happy. She goes, tank after tank I go to, the fish swim up. They, they don't run away. They, they, they look like they, they like it. Mm -hmm. You know, they get, they get the best food I can I can provide. they the cleanest water I can do. You know, they're they got cover, you know, they're plants and snails and they're you know, as natural environment as I can provide and still run a fish store. And, you know, I go into some of my, I used to go into some of my competitors and you'd see these friggin' empty glass boxes with fish that were terrified, terrified, did not want to be there, racing back and forth and, you know, and Look, hiding, you know, hiding behind the filters because they got nothing yeah. else. They're not. They don't have a sense of security. Right. Exactly. Too bright and a light. It's yeah. It 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 baffles me that people don't get it. That this is not the way to keep an animal. You know. Um. And she was right. I I I do produce happy fish, but it's not magic. It's just common sense. And so, but there's, there's a huge catch 22 there that I've, I've found because I produce fish and sell fish to people too. But it, it's, I found the problem is, is you got, I guess you got to try and find a balance between making the sale and having happy fish. So you take uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith that are the suburbs, they roll up in their Lexus to the fish store, they want to get little Tommy a, a 29 gallon tank and, and with some pretty green and pink and, and blue fish. They don't want to go into a shop that's got algae on the glass. They'd be horrified. We don't have, as consumers, we don't have perfect view of your fish. Oh, your fish are hiding behind some plants. We can't see them perfectly to buy them. 
these are some of the people we have to try to appease too. And that's why I say this. It's got to be a balance. You go to some of these big box stores that the glass is always perfect, everything. I know it. You know it. Everybody on our chat knows it, that chances are a lot of those fish are unhealthy. If they don't have anything in there to give them a sense of security, keep their stress down, everything else, they're probably destined for failure in a, in a short-lived life. But the Smiths sometimes are not going to come into a shop that might have a bit of algae on the sides creating some nice biofilm for those fish to eat when when you don't have that moment to feed them in their grazers or you have the light dim because those fish are maybe just a little sensitive to light or you have a heavy plant cover on the top right. because if fish are, yep. it, it's it's it sucks it sucks that that the smiths aren't going to go and go and learn they're not going to get educated they just want to buy the fish the sooner that fish fails, the sooner little Tommy gets off their back about the fish and, and they're done with it. That's kind of a shit part of the hobby that I don't like. And I wish that the Smiths would just get more educated and get a nice tank. Well, my shop was not run like any other shop that I know. Um, one thing, it was very kid friendly. Everybody, every shop I know of, don't tap on the glass, don't do this, don't do that do that they're children they that's what they're going to do so i put no fish in bottom tanks within the kids reach that were going to be bothered by it i had a almost two foot long um uh, i had almost two foot long uh, uh that um i trained to eat blueberries and jump out of the water and i uh, let the kids feed it and um I had another tank of African cichlids that I would let the kids go in there with a fish net and try to catch the fish. And cichlids were like, you know, once they figured it out, they were like, no problem. Because every time Game the kids on. Would leave, right, every time the, the kids would leave, I would feed them. So they, you know, some kid would go in there with a net and the fish would be running around and they'd come over and look at me. Is it, is it time for food yet? You know, right. And, but that kind of, of, of thing, uh, you know, I had, I had one mother come in with her two little girls and uh, they left and they were, they were wet, covered in duckweed with smiles from ear to ear, you know, and, uh, and they had a really good time and exposing them to, I mean, granted, you're not supposed to play with your fish and, but we have to get, get kids interested in the natural world. And there's no better way to do that than have them interact with the natural world and teach them the difference between, uh, you know, uh, torturing a cat and playing with a cat. Or, you know, it, and you gotta, you got to teach kids how to relate to the living world around them. And uh, I, had a, I had a funny thing happen one day. I, I had two customers show up at my shop. And uh, about two o'clock in the afternoon, and they, I was catching them some fish, and they said, "Can you pack them for a long run?" And I said, "Well, where do you live down the Cape or New Bedford, which is an hour or so away?" They said, "No, we're from New York City. We drove up this morning to see you." I said, "Wait a minute! You drove from New York to Boston to see my fish store?" I said, "I have a little tiny fish store. You must have passed fifty good stores." They said, well, you're the highest rated store in, you know, in the East Coast. I go, I am? I'm not, a, I'm not a good computer guy. And, um, I mean, I had all these great comments. And it was, it, I mean, I'm a pretty good fish keeper. I'm not going to pat myself on the back too much. But, you know, after 40 or 50 years, you start getting good at this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I find myself on to help people understand how to keep fish and I produce the highest quality fish I can produce. And none of my fish would leave my store unless they were quarantined for 10 days. And nobody else does that. The, I worked in a big box store for three months. I fired for three months fish. I reduced fish losses by 75% and they fired me. Because, oh, you can't do that. I'm like, I can't have you killing. You know, you, we're, we're killing fish here because we, we're not treating them. 
well, that's not that's none of your business. I said, excuse me? I said, what am I here for? Just to expect the people to kill? I said, I can tell you right now which of these fish are going to be dead if I don't treat them. Well, if you treat them, they're not going to buy the treatments there to treat them, right? Oh, and the, the stuff they would try to sell people. I mean, one guy came over. He had a whole, he had an ample of, of, of bottles of stuff. And he goes, this is what the, the girl told me to buy. I go, you need this bottle here of dechlorinate. That's all you need. Yeah. And, I said, and that filter that you're going to buy is way too small. I have a 20 gallon tank and it says 20 gallons on it. I go, yeah, your point. I go, people don't understand that a filter is not rated on the number of gallons, even though that's how we all do it. Marketing. In aquaculture, it's rated on the number of grams of food a day it can digest. And um, I always recommend one size larger filter, at least, to a customer than, than the, the recommendations by the manufacturer. Unless your your tank looks like a washing machine, you don't have too much filtration. And, uh, no, it's pretty hard to. And, <laughs> and, and, I, and I think they, uh, I think uh, we we do got to wrap her up soon, Jim. We're coming up to three hours. You're probably getting thirsty. Uh, but yeah, like it's midnight here. Yeah. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, I guess it is here too. Um, like I have a 180 gallon tank here. I have an FX6 on it. It's rated for 400 gallons. Well, guess what? That's not the only filter on the tank. Right. And it's only a 180 gallon tank. I have a Marineland 360 on it as well. I have an aquaponic system on top of it that pumps water up through a bunch of pothos and right. back into the tank. Like I, I, I never go by filter ratings at all. I go by, I go by bio load on the tank and, uh, how much filter do I need to uh, get rid of this bio load or do I need to get rid of fish? One of the two, something's got to change. That's absolutely right. And <clears throat> I get a lot of shit from people um, because my recommended cost densities are much higher than my special weapons. But I mean, I would typically bring in a box of Cardinals, which is 400 to 500 fish and put them all in a 40 gallon bag. And people go, oh, my God, 10 fish per gallon of water, that's way too much. No, it's not. Not if, if you're careful with your nitrogen management and you're careful with your feeding, it's, it's no big deal. And if you don't teach those skills to people, um, if something, if, if the wheels start coming off, if you're going off the rails, all of a sudden you're not mentally equipped to handle those problems um you know anybody can keep a 10 gallon tank with two fish in it three fish in it you, you probably don't even need a fish. Um, you know if, when, when your stocking densities go up that separates the men from the boys and i'm not advocating overcrowding your tanks but you know having a a viable community i've been in parts of of, of peru where the, the biomass was just astounding between shrimp and snails and, and fish and critters and just amazing yeah it's got it's got to have some balance right like we were talking it's yeah. uh nothing works unbalanced well jim this has been a fantastic stream i can't believe uh, i think this has been my longest live stream yet i don't think i've ever gone three hours <laughs> but uh, I, I think we had a great talk. I'm really happy with our talk. Um, I hope you are. Um, any last messages you want to get out to uh, anybody? I'm um, not really. We want to do this again, I think, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm willing to do it again. Sure. I mean, um, education is everything, in my opinion. And um, uh, as my friend Russell goes, we both killed a lot of fish to get where we are today. And <laughs> I'm hoping that I can uh, promulgate some education to people that enable them not to kill some fish. Yeah. My, my, my mistakes, you know. Um, but the fish keeping world is a wonderful world. It's, uh, it's dynamic. It's ever changing. And, you know, most of us don't appreciate how lucky we are 
to be living right now in this world of diversity that is shrinking on us at an alarming rate. Just maybe we maybe we can talk about that next stream. Stay on stay on for me for a, a couple minutes, Jim. After I close out here, okay. Just so uh, uh, yeah. next Saturday we're launching Jungle Jim's Fish Room. All uh, right, with with Jason. Jason, Jason, do you want to put the link? Jason's in in the chat right now. Jason, okay. do you want to put the link up for that before we uh, before we close out? I, I don't mind at all. So go ahead. We've had uh, we've had some uh, great viewers in the chat all night. Thank you everybody for uh, taking part in the chat, and thank you for my moderators. This is something I forget to do half the time. Do you know what a moderator is, Jim? Um. That's the thing that keeps an engine from going too fast. <laughs> well, uh, for, for live streams on YouTube, a, a moderator is someone that kind of keeps your chat going. Someone helps you find information if you need to find it. If you got some bad, bad apples in your chat, which I've never had to deal with people coming in and just stay, saying stupid shit in your chat or whatever, trying to cause trouble. Uh, they get rid of them too. So, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I think it, no, I I have very little experience in this. I'm a, I'm a dinosaur, you know? Yeah. So people come on here and, and, uh, use their time to do this. So I, I really appreciate all the moderators we do have. Um, I'm just waiting to see here. Um, uh, if Jason's going to, uh, throw up his link for, uh, this Saturday stream. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be visiting various fish rooms around the country. Um, a bunch in Massachusetts until I go to back to Florida. And then I'm going to be going down to fish farms and, and producers down there. And uh, I'm going to be talking to the people that are actually breeding fish, you know, the nuts and bolts of the aquarium industry. And, uh, That's awesome. I can't wait to see fun. that. Yeah. So I don't know if... Uh, if uh, Jason's going to be able to get that on there. But anyways, check out uh, Redfish Bluefish. Yep. Uh, it's on his channel, and you will see Jim there as well. Anyways, thank you, everybody, from the chat. Thank you, Jim. Everybody, welcome, happy fish keeping. Take care. I'll stay on for a couple minutes, right? Okay. Take care, everybody.